Ahora vamos a Hello, good morning. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the, the tech support for the Portuguese presidency.
Good morning. Welcome to the conference Rule of Law in Europe. The opening session will start soon. Please take your seat. Good morning. Welcome to Portugal and Coimbra. It is with pleasure that we welcome you all to the high-level conference Rule of Law in Europe, joint, jointly organized by the Portuguese Presidency of the Council in the European Union and the European Commission. For the first welcoming remarks, the Mayor of Coimbra, Manuel Machado, has the floor. Minister of State and Foreign Affairs, Mr. Santos Silva, Commissioner for the Justice, Mr. Didier Reinders, Justice Minister, Ms. Francisca Van Dunen, Rector of the University of Coimbra, Professor Falcão, magistrates and rulers, academic and human rights activists, dear guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Coimbra is honored to greet you all and welcome you to this convent of San Francisco in the framework of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. And to host you, the minister responsible for European Affairs and a higher level conference on the rule of law in Europe. Coimbra is a meeting point for people and different persons with different beliefs and religions that characterize uh, its framework since the origin of, Port of Portugal as a nation state. Laws, right, the thought, research, 
are the legal grounds of the states. And here in the city, uh, the university was founded in 1290. So, and the University of Coimbra was founded. And here at university, we had remarkable people from Europe who taught and learned philosophy, humanities, science, and law. To give you only one example, on the 20th of February, 1867, upon proposal of the Minister for Ecclesiastical Affairs and Justice, Barjonet Freitas, who was born in Coimbra, the abolition of the death penalty was approved in Portugal and invoking the reason of humanity and feeling, the rules of law and the trends of civilization guided by those principles. Let us remember the Victor Hugo chart, 1867. So the death penalty is abolished in Portugal, a small people that has a great history. I uh, congratulate your parliament, said Victor Hugo, and I congratulate your nation, because by giving example to Europe is benefiting from, from that immense glory of not having death penalty. Europe, said Victor Hugo, Europe will imitate Portugal. Death to death penalty, war to war, hate to hatred, hail life. Freedom is an enormous city of which we all are citizens. I shake your hand as a fellow countryman in humanity, and I salute your spirit. Signed, Victor Hugo. He, thus, we can say that Coimbra has been for more than 700 years a city that is deeply European, open to the world, and with a Europeanist vocation that always characterized us. And so we present the candidacy of uh, Coimbra as European capital of culture in 2027. We are building this candidacy, this application, gathering people, institution, and ideas around this candidacy that will enable us to represent Portugal um, among its European uh, nations. Ladies and gentlemen, since the Schumann Declaration of 1950, we have considered that the European Union would be built in the respect of equality among all people before the law, and that the European process would respect always, at all times, fully respect the rules of the rule of law, of the democratic rule of law. In view of the authoritarian uh, shifts that we see all over the world, we must say that law rules above everything and its rules. This is today a European, a Europeanist cause of the utmost importance, very much up to date and highly relevant in political terms. As recent years have shown, democ democracies are not irreversible. Democracies need that we fight for them on daily basis in the political area, in the academy, in the media, in the social media, the European Union, the European citizens and countries need to feed their trust in their rule of democratic rule of law. And trust also lies in details and in policies at the local, starting at the local level today local authorities, municipalities, of which I am a proud representative, they all also play that role and renew their agendas. Policies for housing, for education, on nutrition, the social policies on mobility in the cities and on climate change, culture and sports and health, are priorities 
which we stand for on a daily basis. They're a major contribution to reinforce the trust of our populations in democracy. In Coimbra, I'm sure that both this high-level conference on the rule of law in Europe and an informal meeting of ministers, due to the quality of its participants and the quality of reflection, they all will contribute to strengthen the rule of law and the health of European democracies. Please feel at home here at Coimbra in this city of law and democracy. You're most welcome. Thank you. We will now hear some remarks from Demilcar Falcão, Rector of Coimbra University. Honorables, President of the Supreme Court of Portugal, Minister of State and Foreign Affairs of Portugal, Minister of Justice of Portugal, European Commissioner for Justice, President of the, of the European Court of Justice, President of the Supreme Court of Luxembourg, Federal Minister of European Union and Constitution of Austria, Secretary of State for European Affairs, Member of the European Parliament, President of the European Court of Human Rights, President, President of Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, President of the Municipality of Coimbra, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone to Coimbra and tell you that it is an honor for us to have here, although virtually, such distinguished political personalities, both from the world of law, exercising prestigious functions in such decisive positions for justice in Portugal, Europe, and the world, and from civil society in general. Congratulations to the Portuguese presidents of the Council of the European Union and to the European Commission for the promoting this high-level conference on rule of law in Europe, composed by of six sessions so up-to-date and relevant to the lives of citizens in the European Union and in the world. Naturally, the University of Coimbra cannot but thank the possibility that it has been given to be an institutional partner of such a prestigious event. A special thank you also to the European Commission in the person of Sofia Colares Alves, distinguished representative of this, this institution in Portugal and whose excellence, excellence of work is recognized by all for the initiative that tomorrow morning, May 18, will take place at the Trinity College of our centuries old university attended by the Vice President of the Commission for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, Marus Svekovic, and by the Secretary of State for European Affairs, Anna Paula Zacharias, in a dialogue with our students on a subject that is so determinant for the next generations, the future of jobs in the green economy. The European Union, in, on which Portugal are deeply involved, faces serious challenges. The pre-COVID-19 disaggregation was a latent threat uh, with Brexit, and currently only an effective solidarity response to this emer emergency situation will enable the sustainability of this political project that for more than 60 years has stood for peace and prosperity. Divergences must be increasingly mitigated, Leaders must rise to the current demands to prevent citizens from feeling injustice and irrelevance regarding European integration. At the epicenter of the greatest pandemic in living memory, when everyone converges on the idea that we are approaching an economic and social situation even worse than that of 2007-2008, the response of 27 member states cannot leave room for doubts or fears in the population, opening space to be exploited by 
demagogues, populists and extremists, possibly jeopardizing democracy and the rule of law, which are essential pillars of the European integration project. The discussions of, of this conference with political decision makers, representatives of civil society and academia, and allow me here thank in particular the involvement of our faculty of law. It is therefore an event absolutely decisive, not only for the rule of law culture, but also for the very survival of the democratic values and freedom that constitute the DNA of the European Union. And we should be an inspiring example of the current globalization. I thank you all and wish you a good conference. Please welcome now to the stage the Minister of Justice of Portugal, Francisca Van Dunen. Commissioner Didier Reinders, Minister of State and Foreign Affairs, Ladies and gentlemen, ministers, Mayor of Coimbra, Rector of the University of Coimbra, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to address you all at this high level conference from Coimbra, a city of knowledge whose university, one of the oldest in the world, is actively participating in this event. The concept of the rule of law is not new. As early as the 13th century, at the time of the creation of the University of Coimbra, Bracton, a judge from the reign of Henry III said, quote, the king himself must be subject to God and law because the law made him king. End of quote. The rule of law is concerned with the control of public powers through law. Democratic legality is a, 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 a central element. The separation of powers and dependence of the judiciary are essential to its functioning. The rule of law is part of Europe's heritage as a feature of identity common to the political systems of the European states. From the very beginning, the rule of law is part of the matrix of the European project. The Treaty on the European Union enshrines it as one of the values of the, of the Union, values which are common in a society in which plural, pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality prevail. The rule of law is not only central to the construction of the European Union, but also a key piece for our common future. As the preamble to the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European States, the Union has a duty to contribute to the preservation and development of these common values in the member states. The rule of law, democracy and fundamental rights are inseparable building blocks of our societies. Fundamental rights can only be guaranteed if effective judicial protection is provided, if the principle of equality is fully respected, if there is freedom of expression and informed debate with independent and responsible media and an active civil society. The current pandemic situation has made it clear that the protection of the union values cannot be taken for granted. It is a continued endeavor and a shared responsibility that requires a collective effort. 
to protect, promote, and strengthen the rule of law is therefore a priority of the Portuguese presidency, particularly relevant to the area of justice. And I'm pleased to highlight the support of the member states in adopting the Council conclusions on the strengthening of the application of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which welcome the Commission's new strategy and recognize the need to make it effective in people's lives and foster a strong culture of fundamental rights in the Union. The European Union's accession to the European Convention on Human Rights, which remains one of the priorities of the Portuguese presidency, reflects the Union's commitment to the values of democracy and the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen an increase in certain forms of criminality, namely cybercrime, counterfeiting of medicines and medical products, hate crimes, domestic violence, and the sexual abuse of children. Fighting crime, namely organized crime, by all admissible legal means is a duty of the rule of law in order to protect fundamental rights, democratic institutions, and the values that hold us together. The pandemic has also shown the need to speed up the modernization of justice by using the new information and communication technologies. The justice digitization program underway could not therefore be left outside of our priorities. Digitization has proved critical to courts for courts to continue functioning. The investment in digital infrastructure and training made it possible to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and guarantee everyone, even in the most difficult times, the right of access to justice. Discussion on the effects of the pandemic on the rule of law is unavoidable. Difficult decisions had to be taken and restrictions imposed on fundamental rights in the state of exception. In order to protect their health, people had to stay at home, limit their contacts, close the doors of their businesses, wear face masks or undergo compulsory tests. At the European level, these measures had a substantial impact on freedom of movement. This situation has made the need to strengthen the rule of law even more obvious. Restricting rights and requiring the normal functioning of institutions implies responsibility and control. Courts played an essential role in this respect as guarantors of the constitution, constitution and fundamental rights. So the independence of courts is a value per se. In Portugal, the constitutional framework of the state of emergency was put into practice for the first time in democracy. Parliament remained in office and played a key role in defining and monitoring the state of emergency measures. The Ombudsman and the Public Prosecution Office remained in permanent functioning, standing for democratic legality and citizens' rights. The pandemic also showed how the criteria of necessity and proportionality in restricting rights and the effective independence of the powers of the state are essential to the rule of law. Although subject to demanding tests in the context of the, of the pandemic, the rule of law has a meaning and a function that are inextricably linked to peace, to peace, to freedoms, and the guarantee of security and justice in the daily lives of our citizens beyond the pandemic. The first report on the rule of law in the Union was published in 2020, and the preparation of the 2021 report is currently underway. It has never been more topical to discuss the rule of law, while work continues to deepen it. 
and justice systems play a key role in its defense, promotion, and consolidation. I therefore look forward to hearing the different approaches to this subject in the presentations and in the debates that will follow. I wish you all a good day's work. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage the European Commissioner of Justice, Didier Reinders. Bom dia, dear Minister Santo Silva de Augusto, dear Minister Van Dunem de Francisca, dear Mayor Machado, dear Victor Falcao, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, I'm honored to be with you uh, today in Coimbra, this uh, prestigious place. The University of Coimbra has a long and proud academic tradition. It has been a center of European legal scholarship dating all the way back to the 13th century. I welcome that the Portuguese presidency is making the rule of law a central theme of its presidency. Respect for the rule of law is key for the European Union. I know that Portugal is very aware of this, and the Portuguese people had to endure the longest dictatorship in Europe in the last century. Your country knows that the rule of law has a direct impact on people's daily lives. It is therefore no coincidence that Portugal is hosting the first high-level conference on the rule of law in Europe. In the name of the European Commission, I want to thank you for this. This conference offers us a rich program, allowing us to explore many different and essential dimensions of the rule of law. This is so reflected in the diverse group of speakers that have been invited. In particular, I welcome that we will start this event with discussing about the role of civil society for upholding the rule of law. Promoting the rule of law with the help of civil society is a key priority for the Commission. Civil society is an essential watchdog, spotting early on the warning signs for threats to the rule of law and keeping institutions accountable. Civil society organizations are also providing to all of us with uh, invaluable input on the situation on the ground. They are equipping uh, for giving us to act against measures which are contrary to our values and EU law. Another important dimension we will discuss today is the role of European and national courts for upholding the rule of law. It should go without saying, the application of EU law relies not only on the European Court of Justice, but also on national courts in the member states. National judges are EU judges, and national courts must meet the requirements of effective judicial protection. The Court of Justice has clarified that an essential requirement of effective judicial protection is judicial independence. This was a groundbreaking development, and we owe it, by the way, to the landmark Portuguese judges ruling of the Court of Justice of 2018, a preliminary reference from a Portuguese court. In the afternoon, a panel will discuss communicating on the rule of law. How do we explain to our citizens that the rule of law matters to them, that this is not about some far away judge, but that the rule of law affects their daily lives. This is um, not an easy task. We need to address it if we want to build a rule of law culture in the Union. This is a joint responsibility for
for us all. And I welcome that the panel on this topic will feature practitioners dealing with this challenge from which we can all learn. The panel on the rule of law under the Lisbon Treaty will further explore elements of the academic and legal debate on the rule of law. We are now more than a decade after the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. The Conference on the Future of Europe just started. This is a good moment to take stock. Is uh, the attention given to the rule of law a sign of progress in the EU legal integration? You will not be surprised to hear that I certainly think it is. Tomorrow, two panels will discuss the link of the rule of law with the COVID-19 pandemic and with social progress and economic recovery. The rule of law and effective justice systems are essentials for our resilience in times of the pandemic. Did we manage to strike the right balance between public health requirements and safeguarding our values? We will be able to ensure a sustainable and inclusive recovery. This is crucial for the fairness of our single market, for the effectiveness of social rights, and for an investment-friendly environment. The economic and social effects of the pandemic underline more than ever the need to strengthen the resilience of our justice systems. And uh, we will work on this in the next months and years. I also want to share with you some impressions from my own engagement for the rule of law. Learning from the experiences in each member state is a key objective of the European rule of law mechanism. The Commission created it last year. It consists of two parts, the Commission's annual report and the rule of law dialogue, with, which is based on this report on the rule of law. The mechanism is a preventive tool aimed at detecting challenges to the rule of law before they emerge or deepen. It allows member states to identify best practices and learn from each other. The objective of our monitoring is to better understand the situation in all 27 member states. For each of them, we have a dedicated chapter. The Commission is currently uh, further deepening this assessment for the second annual report. It will be published in July. We will, in particular, follow up on the challenges identified in the first report and those arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. However, promoting and upholding the rule of law cannot be a top-down process. This is why the rule of law report is based on an inclusive approach. We have collected written input from a large range of stakeholders, including civil society and civil society organizations. This is crucial for deepening our country-specific knowledge. We have also recently concluded the virtual country visits, uh, during which we had over 400 meetings with national authorities, independent bodies, and stakeholders. It is our common interest to develop this ex expertise further. And it is important to make the best use of this report as a basis for a genuine dialogue on the rule of law with a wide variety of actors. Engagement with parliaments is a priority for me. Over the past months, I have been debating in the uh, European Parliament, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and in 20 national parliaments. Our event will bring together politicians, judges, lawyers, civil society, academics, and journalists. It will be a unique opportunity to learn from each other. I also want to thank the Portuguese presidency for organizing the second country-specific rule of law dialogue on the basis of our report in the General Affairs Council in April. I want to thank and Paula Zakarias for that. It was very constructive and informative. We will have another more specific rule of law discussions 
uh, in the Justice Council in June, it will focus on key elements for the public prosecution services. And I welcome that the incoming Slovenian presidency already announced the next rule of law dialogue for the Geneva Council in the autumn. It will be based on the new edition, of course, of our rule of law report. All this improves our knowledge of what is happening in all our member states. That is also crucial for making the best possible use of our rule of law toolbox. It consists, among others, of infringement proceedings, country-specific recommendations in the European semester, and Article 7. Since January this year, we also have the budgetary conditionality regulation. The Commission is currently working on guidance for its application, but you know that the regulation is into force since the 1st of January this year, so we are already monitoring the situation in all the Member States, and we will continue uh, to use all the different tools at our disposal to try to improve the rule of law. But the best tool is maybe the annual rule of law report and the organization of such a kind of conference, because they are the best ways to try to organize again a real culture of the rule of law in all the Member States. And to conclude, let me assure you that the Commission uh, remains fully committed to the rule of law and uh, we want to uphold and prospect, uh, protect sorry, the, the rule of law in all the member states uh, in the near future. As Mario Soares, one of the fathers of Portuguese democracy and a great supporter of the accession of Portugal to the then European Economic Community, said back in 1977, democracy and the safeguard of individual rights should be higher and inalienable values of a united Europe. The rule of law is essential to continue making this a reality. I wish you, of course, a very uh, good moment in such a conference and a great conference with many uh, fruitful discussions. Well, we gather. We invite to the stage the Minister of State and Foreign Affairs of Portugal, Augusto Santos Silva. Good morning, everyone. I'm actually going to close this opening session with my statement. And I'd just like to put across two very important messages, and they're both very simple messages. First of all, I'd like to say a few words of thanks. Thanks to everybody who have, uh, who's cooperated with us to organize this very first high-level event at European level on the subject of the rule of law. I'd like to thank the European Commission, here represented by Commissioner Didier Reinders. Bonjour, mon cher ami. During the uh, conference, Vice President Maros Sefcovic and Vice President Vera Jourova are going to represent the Commission in the conference itself. I'd like to thank member states. I'd like to thank all colleagues who are ministers in charge of European affairs or deal with European affairs and are going to be uh, taking part in this conference too. But I'd also like to say that this is only possible thanks to the cooperation we've had from the university, the academy and the law school here in Coimbra. And so I'd very much like to thank the rector of the University of Coimbra for being here today and allowing us to host it here. This is one of the greatest universities of Europe. And I'd also like to thank the mayor of Coimbra for the warm welcome that this city is giving to the conference. This conference is only being possible thanks to the commitment we've had from other European institutions. Uh, of those, I'd like to highlight the European Economic and Social Committee in particular. And there are other international organizations like the United Nations who have made a contribution. So this conference is only possible because of all of those uh, 
bodies and institutions participating either in person or remotely in some way. And so uh, the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union is very grateful to you for your participation and your help. My second message is also very straightforward. The rule of law is one of the fundamental issues uh, which are a part of the presidency program for the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. It's one of the key points of action for the presidency. We have been cooperating very closely with the European Parliament and indeed with the European Commission. This has also been in very close cooperation with all the EU member states. In this way, I think that we are giving a proper follow-up to uh, all the work that we've been doing on this second round of five member states uh, with whom we've had a rule of law dialogue to see what the state of play is. The General Affairs Council carried out this evaluation in April. That's what we've done so far. And we will continue, of course, with the Article 7 procedures in the uh, General Affairs Council format of Council. However, in other Council formations, the rule of law has also been a major topic for the Council. Uh, the Justice Ministers, for example, in the JHA, they've looked at the proper application of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and new strategies for applying that in practice. It's also been dealt with in the Social Affairs Council format. They've been looking at uh, inclusion strategies and our action plan to combat discrimination, racism, anti-Semitism and hate speech. And it's also been dealt with in the Foreign Affairs Council in our council, where we've been uh, using the new instrument, which is a, a general uh, tool for imposing sanctions for violations of human rights. So the rule of law is a cross-cutting topic, which uh, is dealt with by all the formations of the Council of the European Union. And therefore, it's been very significant and important for the Portuguese presidency. Rule of law is is our business. It's not somebody else's business that somebody else has to take a view on. It's uh, our business, all of our business. All of us should care about it because it's an absolute uh, sine qua non for our membership of the European Union. It's a prerequisite. We are members of the European Union because we practice the values of the European Union. And among those values, um, rule of law is certainly a key one. The rule of law is also a really significant topic because it's a way for all of us to ensure that we can safeguard human rights, that we can safeguard people, we can protect those people. And we have to um, scrutinize this continuously. We have to make sure that we check with a peer review what we are all doing in this area. There is an annual report from the European Commission on the state of play, the state of the state uh, of law. Uh, that's produced every year. And we have a, a peer review, an in-depth peer review, where all member states take a look at what the state of play is for the rule of law in each and every member state. However, it's a topic that should be of interest to all Europeans. It is indeed an important topic which will be taken up in the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe, which has begun under the Portuguese presidency. The final aim of the rule of law is to protect people, and therefore it should be something which we all care about. And now here in the conference, we have uh, professors, uh, judges, uh, representatives of national and international courts, I'd just like to welcome all of you here. We have representatives from the institutions, uh, from member states, the social partners. The fact that you're all here or taking part in this conference is essential because we're all together here to defend the rule of law in Europe. Thank you.
To open the first session of the conference, we welcome on stage Professor José Eros de Linhares, who will now conduct a discussion on the role of civil society to uphold the rule of law and the ways to involve citizens in decision making. The session will now start. Uh, I am deeply honored to chair this session on behalf of UCLA, the University of Coimbra, Institute for Legal Research, old more so since it premises to plunge us immediately into a decisive thematic core concerning the role of civil society for upholding the rule of law, if not directly the levels of effective assimilation and ways of responsible participation which regarding its citizens, the European project simultaneously provides and demands. The time we have is certainly relentlessly scarce, and it is important that we make the most of it. So um, I invite everyone to listen to the pre-recorded message that in this context is addressed to us by Mr. Juan Fernando López Aguilar, member of the European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Hello, good day. Hello, Coimbra. Hello, Portuguese Presidency. It is my honor to salute once again the rotating presidency of the European Union that Portugal is carrying out for this first semester of 2021 with a much energetic and well-meant agenda. For one thing, of course, I appreciate that it's been back on track, the European social pillar, the European social agenda. I cannot appreciate enough the point that you have made about the importance of 
rule of law, because ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force along with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, this European Parliament, and particularly the committee that I have the honor to chair, the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, has been well aware that never before had the European Union this political dimension about the real core of us being together, which is not the single market, which is not the central bank, which is not even the single currency, the euro, it's about values, it's about common values, it's about those values which are enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, starting with rule of law, democracy and fundamental rights, which is something that concerns not only the European architecture, not only the public authorities, both of the European Union and the member states, but also civil society and citizens alike, because it's about the citizens, which are actually the real protagonists of the European supranational integration. That is what the Conference of the Future of the European Union is about, involving the citizens, involving civil society, involving NGOs, non-governmental organizations, academia, think tanks, thinkers about the European process. And I therefore salute very much that the Coimbra High Level Conference is actually making the point about the role of civil society in enhancing rule of law. This committee I chair, the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs has taken very seriously rule of law precisely because it has been enhanced like never before as the founding value of the European integration. That is why we cared about clear risks of serious breach as to the rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy. That is why we have been involved when it comes to setting forth the procedures which are included in the Treaty of the European Union linking Article 2 with Article 7. That is why we put in place the so-called rule of law fundamental rights and democracy framework and policy cycle precisely to encounter the allegation that the concerns of the European Parliament could be biased one way or the other or could go political one way or the other. We're making the point that it's a cycle which is meant to overarch all of the member states and examine in a preventive basis the parameters, objectively, the parameters as to the compliance, full compliance of rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy standards, which are the European Union reason to be. And that is why precisely we accompanied this rule of law policy cycle with the rule of law conditionality regulation that we um, stressed when negotiating the multi-annual financial framework and the European budget as a component element of the European dynamic and the European commitment to these founding values, which are so important, so core to the agenda of the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs. And that is why I would also like to salute this point that the Portuguese presidency is making about the involvement of civil society and rule of law. We have cared about what we have called rule of law literacy raising awareness and sharing with academia, with the law enforcement agents, including judiciary, including public prosecutors, of course, but also NGOs and think tanks about what the rule of law is about. We have stressed time and again that the European idea of rule of law and democracy does not confine itself to rule by majority. It's about rule of law, respecting minorities, respecting pluralism and respecting the role of media pluralism and respecting the role of media freedom. Media pluralism is the ultimate expression of media freedom. And that is why we care about training, educating all professions and all protagonists of the democratic process throughout the European Union according to the standards that had been set by the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and the European Court of Justice, which has validated the 
Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union as a canon of validity of the European law in all. And we stress the importance of communication and pedagogy so that we may share through promotion campaigns all of the rule of law mechanisms that we have put in place in the past few years, underlining the role, the vital role of civil society. We have shared these views in the gatherings that we've had with national parliaments, which is a practice that we have put in place according to the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union interparliamentary conferences, in which the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs shares views, concerns, and prospects for improving our future with the national parliaments, not only through the institutional framework of the Conference of Parliamentary Committees uh, for Union Affairs, the so-called COSAC, but also sharing these views and spreading these views throughout a series of hearings with the interlocutors, the stakeholders of the civil society, organizations, networks, experts, not only judicial experts and public prosecutors experts, not only legal professionals, but also journalists, and opinion leaders and actually European leaders which are aiming to make a difference, supporting the comparative measurement agenda and undertaking an analysis of capability for the public agents in all. We know that in order to put in place this, what we might call a critical infrastructure for enhancing the importance of the rule of law, we have to bear in mind which are the threats to the rule of law by now. Disinformation, interference, and of course, as a vector which is gaining importance for the past few years, hate speech and hate crime as a major threat to European values. We have to take it seriously, and we have. We have put in place a special committee in order to deal with these foreign interference into the democratic processes throughout the member states of the European Union and making an impact in the democratic process of the European Union itself. That is why we think that as an outcome, we should try to put in place a multi-stakeholder policy dialogue with conclusions which are effective to put in place this European network of commitment to the founding values of the rule of law. We have also, of course, adopted a number of resolutions, making the point of the connection between rule of law values and civil society. Actually, there is a particular report that we have adopted in the Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, trying to make the point on disinformation and misinformation in order to come up with the proper ideas, not only literacy, digital literacy, so that European citizens can tell the difference between truth and lies, between fake news and information, even between opinion and facts, which is of the importance when it comes to enhancing this digital literacy and disinformational literacy, but also to prevent the impact of hate speech and hate crime, we need to take seriously the importance of lawmaking, including criminal lawmaking. That is criminal legal responses, responses in terms of criminal law to tackle the threat of hate speech leading to hate crime. Because let's face it, let's be serious. Hate speech leads to hate crime. Hate speech does not confine itself to freedom of expression or speech. Hate speech leads to actual crime, to actual violence, to actual violations of the dignity of the human beings and the dignity of citizens, which are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights are binding for all the member states. And those rights are to be claimed by the citizens the European citizens, that is, the citizens of every member state of the European Union, before the Courts of Justice, all the way to the European Court of Justice itself. A final point that I would like to make is that, yes, that needs also to be supported in budgetary terms and financial terms. And we have also made that point. We have stressed 
very much the importance of values, citizens' participations, equality, the Daphne program being properly funded with proper allocations in the European budgeting. We have managed to secure nothing less than 1 billion point five euros for financing the so-called values and rights program of which at least 46 or 40, 43 44 percent are financing the so-called values program which is values connecting with not only institutions but also civil society ngos precisely to spread the news that values are core for the future of the European Union in the prospect of this conference, which is to gather the citizens around the European prospect of the European integration process. There's 23% for the equality program, particularly to secure gender equality through the Daphne program and another 23% to enhance the importance of the participation of citizens in this democratic process. That is why I want to appreciate very much the agenda that the Portuguese presidency has put in place and the delivery that certainly will be the assessment, the positive assessment that the Portuguese presidency once again will secure by the end of this semester. Thank you very much. After this stimulating opening, it's time to give the floor to our brilliant ensemble of interlocutors uh, with the request, always inopportune but inevitable, of great restraint in these initial interventions. Um, as, as we all know, this should not significantly exceed the proposed five to eight minutes. Um, in the debate um, that will follow, there will be surely more opportunities to complete and clarify your arguments. And we begin with His Excellency Mr. Stef Bloch, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Thank you. And uh, allow me to thank the Portuguese Presidency and the European Commission for this important conference today. Because the rule of law is cornerstone for the European cooperation. And every member state has voluntarily signed up to the Union's founding values. They form the core of our European identity. And they make us proud to be Europeans. But they also ensure that the EU works as an internal market, as an area of freedom and security and justice. And safeguarding the rule of law is a prerequisite for mutual trust between member states and effective cooperation. And this is why promoting the rule of law is one of the key priorities in the Dutch EU policy. And it has a special significance that this conference takes place today, on the 17th of May, the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, Idahot Day. This day reminds us of the responsibility that rests upon all of us, but governments in particular, to promote and to protect the human rights of all, regardless of who they are or whom they love. And it also reminds us of the duty all governments have to ensure an enabling environment for civil society without arbitrary rules or intimidation. Civil society and independent media are essential watchdogs in healthy democracies and therefore play a key role in holding to account those in power. And the same goes for an independent judiciary. Attempts to weaken or put pressure on them are always a clear warning sign. Of course, many different democracies thrive in Europe. This is not a matter of one size fits all. But there are limits. The rules of law cannot be set aside for the sake of elections or the will of the majority. No government can ever uphold the rule of law by applying it selectively. 
And no political system can flourish if journalists of, or civil society organizations are not free or safe to do their job. And no society can ever defend human rights while excluding certain groups from its protection. Upholding the rule of law therefore requires constant vigilance, serious dialogue, and whenever needed, corrective action. In the past year, major steps have been ta taken at EU level to protect and strengthen the rule of law. The new Justice, Rights and Value Fund enables the European Commission to support initiatives upholding EU values and the rule of law with the funds they need. And the inclusion of the rule of law conditionality in the EU budget will enable enforcement should violations of the rule of law threaten the EU's financial interests. The Commission's new annual rule of law report will help us identify problems in this area at an earlier stage and work together on solutions through dialogue. Enforcement action is of the essence when member states violate rule of law principles. The rule of the European Commission as the independent guardian of the treaties is crucial in this regard. Let me end my contribution by reminding you of the Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, whose parents were born here in Portugal. His clear conviction was that the state power should never reside in one person alone. Spinoza was an early unconditional supporter of the balance of power, rule of law, freedom of opinion and religion. In 1670, he wrote, the true purpose of the state is in fact freedom. And I hope that Spinoza's vision will inspire us today in our efforts to strengthen the rule of law and make it a reality in the lives of our citizens. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's time now for us to, to listen to Professor Caroline Fernel, uh, Chair of the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions, uh, whose remarkable research about the law uh, of evidence, allow me this, this only this remark, I have been attentively following. Uh, Professor Caroline Fernel, it's a pleasure welcoming you, even though only virtually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. It's a great pleasure um, to be at this very important conference, though, as you say, um, unfortunately, not in person. Uh, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the University of Coimbra, the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union and the European Commission, Vice President of the Commission Jourova and Commissioner Reyners and their teams for organizing this important high-level conference and including a focus on the role of civil society for upholding the rule of law as the first panel of the high-level event. I am Commissioner of the Irish National Human Rights Institution and currently Chair of ENRI, the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions, bringing together 47 NHRIs from across the EU and Council of Europe member states. National human rights institutions are not part of government and are not civil society organizations, but are independent bodies established by constitution or law to promote and protect human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. While not being part of government or civil society organizations, ENRIs work with government, parliament, and the judiciary, as well as with civil society, human rights defenders, and individual rights holders. NHRIs are unique in that they are periodically undergo an international peer review process with reference to UN Paris principles to assess both their independence and effectiveness. This accreditation reinforces NHRIs as trusted interlocutors on the ground for rights holders, for civil societies, organizations, for state actors and international bodies. Accordingly, within the context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as within the EU rule of law framework, the existence of an independent and effectively functioning NHRI in compliance with the Paris principles is recognized as an indicator of the respect of rule of law in a country. 
Currently, 18 EU member states have A status accredited NHRIs, which are deemed fully compliant with the PARS principles. Five EU countries, Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Slovakia, and Sweden, have a B status institution, which is partially compliant, while two EU member states, Romania and the Czech Republic, have non-accredited institutions in place, and Italy and Malta are working on the establishment of the NHRI. ENRI stands ready to support member states with technical advice to establish and strengthen NHRIs in compliance with the Paris principles. And we are grateful also for the support of the European Commission for NHRIs and ENRI in this respect. Human rights and the rule of law are interlinked and mutually reinforcing principles. A strong regime of the rule of law is vital for the protection of human rights and the rule of law can only be fully realized in an environment that protects human rights. NHRIs therefore, and I quote from the Commission's 2020 Rule of Law report, play an important role as rule of law safeguard and provide an independent check on the system in a rule of law crisis. On the basis of their broad human rights mandate, NHRIs contribute to healthy checks and balances and rule of law in a variety of ways including through providing human rights impact assessments of draft policies and legislation, undertaking strategic inventions before interventions before courts, and facilitating individuals' access to justice and promoting a culture of rule of law through developing capacity, building of state authorities, and awareness-raising campaigns for the wider public. Since last year, European NHRIs through ENRI have started an annual common reporting process on the situation of the rule of law in Europe. The common report brings together each NHRI's perspectives on the state of the rule of law in that country, based on their human rights monitoring and reporting functions. The report also gives an overview of trends and challenges, including on the independence and effectiveness of NHRI's, restrictions on civil society space, pressure on democratic checks and balances, justice systems, media pluralism, corruption, and responses to the COVID-19 outbreak. ENRI's 2021 report submitted to the European Commission shows that negative trends identified in the ENRI 2020 rule of law reporting were further exacerbated over the past year. An example of this that was addressed by um, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission was the issue of the blurring of the distinction between criminal and non-criminal conduct in the context of public health restrictions, which had differential and serious impact on more vulnerable and marginalized groups. Part of these problems have been the challenge brought about by COVID-19 pandemic and the associated introduction of public health measures. But the 2021 ENRI report finding confirms the need to safeguard and strengthen solid checks and balances including by supporting fully independent and effective NHRIs against the background of such challenges to their work and sometimes even threats to their independence. The ENRI submission shows the need for continued EU monitoring of developments affecting the root of law and human rights and for reinforced follow-up actions, including the establishment and strengthening of NHRIs and the safeguarding and promoting of vibrant space for civil society. By engaging in European rule of law monitoring mechanisms, NHRIs can help policymakers reach a more comprehensive and informed assessment of the situation in each country. This in turn can lead to stronger impacts of follow-up actions to drive progress in the national and European rule of law and human rights environment. NHRIs will continue to act at national level and engage with relevant international mechanisms, including EU institutions, to further realize the enjoyment of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law across the region. I look forward to our continuing cooperation and discussion, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next interlocutor is Berber Biola Hettinger, um, Senior Executive Officer of Amnesty International and an expert in, on human rights in the European Union. It's uh, a pleasure welcoming you here, even though virtual. Thank, Thank you, very, you very much. much. 
Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank the Portuguese Presidency and the European Commission for the invitation to speak at this conference. Um, it is encouraging that the Portuguese Presidency included the rule of law among their priorities. Of course, we had our expectations and the signing of the Lisbon Treaty during the previous Portuguese Presidency was truly a landmark moment in EU history, promising stronger human rights protection in, in and by the EU. Some may have thought things could only get better from there, but our current reality is grim. Now here we are today, 14 years later, some through a screen and others in beautiful Coimbra, discussing the rule of law in Europe, as we have done actually many times in the past years. The reason this topic has risen so far to the top of the EU agenda, however, is not just to strengthen this union of values, like in Lisbon in 2007, it is rather a reaction to serious challenges to these very values. We've seen, for example, that respect for the rule of law cannot be taken for granted within the EU territory. And what can we do about that? I'll return to this point later. And just to say, just like one can't control the weather, you can't control works when they're happening in an apartment building. So I do hope that the noise in the background is not really caught uh, by this microphone too much. First, I'd like to say a few words about the important work civil society does every day to uphold the rule of law. This work includes monitoring and research, strategic litigation, training professionals, providing legal aid and human rights education, advocating and campaigning for human rights, and explaining the meaning and importance of human rights and the rule of law to the general public. The rule of law is a concept that doesn't really mean much to most people. And this is why Amnesty International Hungary, jointly with colleagues across Europe, rolled out a campaign in which six brave Hungarians who worked to advance human rights in different ways shared their personal stories. Stories that shed light on the importance of the rule of law in our everyday lives. And these stories were told for the general public in Hungary and beyond to better understand what the rule of law is and why people should care. And Amnesty Poland is now putting forward the stories of judges who are facing disciplinary action, harassment, and even prosecution after standing up for the rule bit, of law. Slow down a because you are being interpreted. You should slow down a bit because you're reading. We don't have your script. Thank you. These are some examples of what civil society is doing for the rule of law in their countries and beyond. But with the serious rule of law backsliding in recent years, Many civil society organizations are experiencing firsthand how close the link between the rule of law and fundamental rights really is, as their own rights and their ability to function are seriously threatened. Repressive laws are being adopted without due process. The justice system can no longer be trusted to stand up for their rights. Law enforcement is repressing rather than protecting peaceful protesters. And hard fought rights, such as the right to abortion and legal gender recognition, are rolled back rather than advanced by captured courts and by governments that no longer seem to care about international human rights obligations. It has more, become more important than ever that we are here to call out human rights violations, that we stand up for the rule of law and that we hold the EU and its member states to account, as mentioned also earlier by Commissioner Reinders. Indeed, we work to support the EU and its member states in their actions by delivering much needed evidence both in writing and in meetings, bringing people who are directly affected by participating in the many consultations, events and processes at the different levels. But we are here too, including today, to call on you and the Commission and the Council to do all within your power to address these serious issues and to stand with the people whose rights are being so blatantly violated. You need to do more. Why is it, for example, that trial monitoring is an integral part of the EU's foreign policy? but that it is hard for the EU to come to trials in Poland, there is unfortunately ample evidence that fair trials can no longer be guaranteed in some countries and human rights defenders and even judges are being prosecuted for standing up for human rights. The EU needs to stand with them and we need a clear policy framework for human rights defenders inside the EU, just like we have one for those in third countries. Support to civil society should seriously be stepped up through EU policy, legislation, political and legal action, funding, and more. And a new rule of law report by the Commission should address civic space issues in more detail and include specific recommendations to member states on how to better protect and support civil society. I'd like to highlight a few examples of the work we do at the European level to counter this threat. If I weren't at this conference this morning, I would be in a coordination call with Polish organizations and European and international networks to see how we can support each other's work and goals. 
the reports from Poland are horrifying, with women's rights activists receiving bomb threats to their offices and homes, facing prosecution and police harassment for organizing peaceful protests, and for standing up for the right of women to decide on matters affecting their own bodies. Jointly, we called on the presidency to finally organize hearings again under Article 7 and to take systemic human rights violations into account. We also called on the commission to start an infringement proceeding to hold the unlawfully composed constitutional tribunal from causing even further damage to human rights. And while the situation in Hungary had been seriously deteriorating for years, the commission refused to apply the rule of law framework or trigger Article 7. So we supported efforts within the European Parliament to take up this duty instead. And the stories from Hungary that I mentioned earlier form the basis for a petition calling on EU affairs ministers to take urgent action with regard to Article 7 proceedings. In a very short period of time, the petition drew over 64,000 signatures, which we handed over in December, ahead of the last General Affairs Council under the German presidency, when we had expected hearings to finally take place again, just like we did for the May session last week. The Human Rights and Democracy Network has put together five points for EU action on civil society and submitted recommendations to ensure the Commission's new rule of law report really provides a basis for interinstitutional cooperation, policy orientation, standard setting and enforcement action by all three EU institutions. But it can be nice to have conferences and rule of law dialogues where we have friendly discussions on how to raise the bar across the board. But if we don't do all in our power to urgently address the serious rule of law backsliding in certain member states, how can we still speak of the EU as a union of values? And what future is there for the EU if mutual trust dissolves and member states are free to disregard the very principles the EU is founded on? But besides stepping up to support to civil society, the Commission really needs to take stronger, faster and more effective legal and political action, including by starting more infringement proceedings and making urgent use of the newly adopted rule of law conditionality mechanism. We call on European Affairs and other ministers to step up action in the Council. At minimum, Article 7 hearings should urgently resume at the upcoming General Affairs Council and Member States should work towards adopting strong and clear recommendations as soon as possible. I look forward to the discussions today and tomorrow and I truly hope this conference and the informal uh, GAC will help prepare the ground for much needed action. Because indeed, as Minister Santos Silva said late earlier, the rule of law concerns us all and we must all do what we can to defend it. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. We shall have now uh, another voice from Netherlands, uh, Mr. Pepijn Heritz, Executive Director of the Netherlands Helsinki Committee. Um, I, I, wel I welcome you with, with pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Portuguese uh, Presidency and DG Justice for inviting me to speak here about the role of civil society in upholding the rule of law, here in Coimbra, one of the oldest temples of science and knowledge. However, as also put forward by my colleague Berber, I would like to start by underlining how unfortunate it is that we still need to have a discussion on this topic, especially considering the fact that all EU member states have signed and ratified the EU treaties, thereby committing to upholding these norms. Yet, the EU at has at least two member states which could not join the Union if they were to apply today. Systemic violations of the rule of law have become part of their governance approach. Ignoring this reality has dire consequences not only for fundamental rights of Hungarian and Polish citizens, or Bulgarian or Maltese for that matter, but for all European citizens. It puts the democratic quality and legitimacy of the entire European project at stake. The rule of law ensures guarantees for citizens to live in a democracy. It protects against authoritarian practices of the state and it provides for an independent judiciary to assess the negative impact of such practices on fundamental rights. Democracy itself is a social process of realizing democratic political aspirations by all citizens, which, be it individually or organized through civil society organizations, need to be able to inspect, monitor, investigate, evaluate, discuss, propose and judge actions of the state. 
Civil society is crucial in any serious democracy, but in the EU, it is part of the normative framework upon which the union was founded. So it is my duty as an EU citizen, our duty as civil society organizations, to monitor and critically evaluate the application of EU treaties, rules and procedures by member states. Protection of the rule of law is a sine qua non for safeguarding the EU values enshrined in the Article 2 of the Lisbon Treaty. If disrespect for rule of law continues, it opens doors for even greater violations of fundamental rights and the erosion of democracies. This threatens the internal market and the financial sustainability of the Union because it corrodes confidence of investors in the EU's reputation and in the single market. Article 7 procedures against Poland and Hungary have been initiated. Instruments and policies have been designed and approved. However, no real action has been taken to stop the backsliding. And it is high time for the EU to focus on enforcement. The Council has not yet held a, dis a dedicated discussion on Article 7 since late 2019. Political will is clearly lacking, despite um, all the member states and the Commission knowing fully well that a breach of rule of law in one of the member states affects the whole union. So it's time to act. And I would respectfully call upon my Portuguese, our Portuguese host to use their extraordinary diplomatic skills and their position as a non-threatening bridge builder to have this topic on the agenda of the June General Affairs Council. To close, I would, like to uh, I would briefly like to highlight five levers of action. The Commission cannot just be a part-time guardian of the treaties. It needs to act each and every time rule of law is at risk in a member state. Unfortunately, at this moment, we often see a slow and legalistic response. As the response is weak, the instruments lose their meaning, supporters of the Union grow disillusioned, and victims feel abandoned. So Article 7 procedures need to be sped up and the conditionality mechanism activated and all of the rule of law mechanisms applied without hesitation. The Commission has the power, so why wait any longer? Member states need to speed up their, uh, step up their political pressure. Individual states need to play a bigger, more visible, more vocal role by re rallying their peers to stand up for the values and principles of the EU. Through the Council, they can push the Commission to assume its role as the guardian of the treaties. But they can also employ direct infringement measures, because rule of law breaches put the interests of each and every member state, such as the common uh, market, at risk. Thirdly, by debating with their governments, national parliaments can make rule of law priority issues on the agendas of member states. They can appoint a rapporteur, formulate concrete and measurable recommendations, and invite civil society to hearings. Parliaments most directly represent people, and the people have indicated time and again in various surveys that an overwhelming majority sees this as a very important topic with a very clear mandate for the EU to act. Fourthly, the European Parliament, as mentioned before, played a defining role in uh, providing civil society with a new funding framework especially designed to defend rights and values in the EU. The Parliament also regularly invites civil society organizations to consultations. However, certain factions in the European Parliament have been dragging their feet before taking concrete action against members with undemocratic tendencies. This has undermined the trust of citizens in the European Parliament and also in the EU institutions. Fifthly and finally, also some self-criticism. Apart from uh, those from countries most affected, citizens and civil society organizations across the EU have been overall very slow to respond to the rule of law backsliding. For most citizens, it's hard to see the direct consequences of their own uh, on their own situation. So society organizations have not invested enough in mobilizing citizens, national governments and parliaments to understand the consequences of rule of law backsliding. However, this is changing, as also indicated by my colleague Berber. My organization, together with the Hungarian and Polish Helsinki committees, is mobilizing peers in all EU member states in order to undertake strategic advocacy and campaigning on rule of law issues, for example, towards national parliaments, by organizing informative hearings. With the Hungarian Helsinki committee, we're also co-organizing 
RARE, Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe, a leadership program for civil society leaders and advocates from 13 member states that builds capacities and strengthens solidarity. This program, implemented um, in partnership with the Hertie School of Governance, mobilizes a network of leaders to call out infringements on, uh, of the fundamental principles of the Union. In brief, civil society stands ready to assist EU institutions and member states. But we need to be more involved in your discussions as well, and above all, better shielded from attacks in those countries where civic space and the rule of law are under pressure. This can be done, firstly, by having the report on the rule of law describing and analyzing the state of civil society in each member state in a detailed manner. And secondly, by creating an EU policy framework for civic space in the Union to ensure a secure space for civil society to play its role more effectively. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is high time for the member states to summon the political will necessary and for the EU institutions to fully operationalize the roles that grant us of the treaties. If not, we risk, we risk the very existence of the Union, its principles and values, and its single market. Muito obrigado. And I have now the pleasure to introduce Professor Dulce Lopes, my, my colleague and the friend at the University of Coimbra Faculty of Law, and also as a member of the Coordination Council of the University of Coimbra Institute for Legal Research. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to say that I'm going to give my statement in English, uh, basically because it's quicker, says the speaker, although there is simultaneous interpretation. So I'll continue in English. making. I will focus on this last point. I should start by stating what is already known. Participation is a main institute in democratic political systems and also an integral part of the rule of law. Not only are these systems based on representative democracy that entails participation in electoral votes, but also they promote several forms of direct participation as a way to engage citizens in public affairs. Introducing significant elements of public participation into the system ensures it opens up to society, both citizens and civil society organizations, and makes public action more relevant, democratic, and trustworthy. But despite the fact that the EU understands, sometimes and at a much level much more developed than some member states, that citizen participation is a much needed reality, as inscribed in Article 11 of the Treaty and also establishes the EU a vast array of participation instruments, such as petitions, public, public consultations, citizens' dialogues, and European Citizens' Initiative, the consequences of this participatory approach continue to be feeble. In the very recent available Eurobarometer about the future of Europe, the vast majority of Europeans, 92% across all member states, demand that citizens' voices are taken more into account in decisions relating to the future of Europe. This generalized feeling and the resulting lack of a true European public space has accompanied the European Union since its inception. And despite the fact that the EU offers several points of access for influencing EU policies, this, this uh, seems not to have a full effect in pra practice. This deficit results mainly of a mismatch between policies increasingly operating at a EU level, while politics still mainly operating at the national level, as Kroger puts it. Therefore, any communication and participation policy regarding the European Union cannot be tackled only by the EU itself. 
It demands a continuing effort also from member states to give relevance to the role of the European Union in decision making, as we believe this and other conferences organized by the Portuguese Council Presidency is trying to do. But more than that, it is important that participation is seen both by public entities and by citizens, not as a hurdle, but as a promise, a promise of effective joint work and joint results. If this is not the case, citizens and civil societies organizations will not be attracted or will even be dissuaded from making their voices heard. Continuing, therefore, in a path that has been described as a path where there is underrepresentation of some actors, interests, and discourses, such as the discourse uh, on fundamental rights that we have been um, today putting forward, discourses that might push the EU uh, um, in a more progressive sense in social, political, and environmental fields. What we see today sometimes it's an overrepresentation of other actors, interests, and discourses, mostly of a pure economical nature that, that are the ones that contribute dominantly to set the agenda of the European Union. Therefore, the EU should develop its pathways for citizens to engage in EU policy making. We are not advocating that EU hasn't done a lot, it has but it has to improve its policies through a better communication and raising awareness policy on the relevance and uh, uh, effective role of civil society. A policy that is directed to all, no matter who, and particularly directed to the ones more affected by its decisions, such as vulnerable groups, younger and older citizens, and representative of sometimes silent or silenced interests. A policy that evidences results by regularly opening up new participation fora or moments as policies are developed and tested and not only at its inception stage. A policy that shows that participation is not only welcomed, but relevant and effective in influencing new policies. For instance, by producing reports that clearly evidence in an understandable way uh, the fashion by which participation influenced the decision-making process. A focal element of participation should be consideration, going beyond, beyond merely consultation. The European Citizens' Initiative, for instance, has this element at its heart. Nonetheless, it should be perfected in order to set aside some blocking trends that render it less relevant than it should be in the EU organizational scheme. Recently, with the Pupini case of the Court of Justice, it was clarified that not only the registration phase of an ECI, but also the communication of the Commission, according to which it clarifies if it intends or not to take legal action on the subject, is, um, is um, possible to be reviewed by the court. This represents a great leap in the understanding of the European Citizens' Initiative mechanism and prompts the Commission to be more open to initiate the legislative procedure after a successful ECI, and therefore give the floor to the European Parliament and the Council to have the final word in what is a matter of concern of at least 1 million citizens, a number which is not easily reached. I am confident in the future of Europe based existentially in the rule of law. Therefore, with some EU partners, we are engaging our students in adopting and proposing uh, European citizens' initiatives. Let's hear what they have to say. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Um, in, in their diversity, all these precious uh, contributions uh, show us that uh, 
the common purpose of uh, strengthening the, the role of civil society in terms of stabilizing and deepening the practices of the rule of law does not end with the institutionalization of possibilities for participation, empowering citizens in, to participate in processes of will formation. It also requires a clear rethinking of what is understood or should be as understood by a common European culture and it, its expected modes of practical interiorization. Uh, the question in, is not only to discuss the processes of deliberative democracy and the open society, it is also to understand what is expected of the pro processes of Europeanization and of the constitutional project that legitimizes uh, them. Uh, on all this in times which, as we have seen, are wounded by severe crises manifested in persistent denunciations of democratic deficits or lack of public legitimation, aggravated by the conflicts between European identity and national identities, threatened by uh, the so-called rule of law uh, backsliding with member states moving further and further away from the founding principles of the European uh, Union, with unavoidable consequences in the practices and contributions of civil society. Uh, it, it would be very rewarding and interesting to listen um, uh, again to our interlocutors concerning this problem of a common European culture but uh, now I think uh, it's time also to um, to to give the floor to the, audi the audience and to ask if we have some uh, questions, we have uh, now this opportunity, and this privilege to have here these interlocutors, uh, and I uh, address the audience in order to know if uh, there are some questions uh, you, you would like to put now. I'm afraid I do not see very well with all <laughs> those slides, but... Oh, that's, please do, please think. Thank you very much. My name is Ana Paula Zacarias. I'm the State Secretary for European Affairs uh, of Portugal. Uh, thank you very much for all your statements. It was very, very interesting. I just would like a very simple question. How do we interact this process with the Conference on the Future of Europe? How do these processes uh, come together? The, the intervention of the civil society and the participation, as Professor Dulslops was uh, stating, uh, what is the role of the Conference on the Future of Europe on this matter? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will give the floor to, to whom we prefer to, 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 to respond. So. Um, well, I think this is a very relevant question, uh, dear uh, Anna Paula. Um, I, I just had um, the first discussion in the Dutch Parliament last week about how to involve um, the public in uh, this uh, conference on the future of Europe. And um, knowing Dutch civil society, I'm not that much worried about participation of Dutch civil society. One of them is sitting next to me and, and he's nodding his head, but, but he can speak for himself, of, of course. I think the challenge for me as a politician, and, and I think also civil society, is to make people aware of the importance of the subject we are discussing. Because speaking for the average Dutchman or women, I think this will not be on top of their agenda. So we will have to take them by the hand, not lecturing them, but take them by the hand, why we are actually busy with this 
because a lot of Dutch voters will ask me, uh, are there no, no other business that you have to involve yourself with, like healthcare or, or jobs in the Netherlands? Um, and of course, it is uh, very well possible to explain why um, uh, also in the, the livelihood uh, of, of an average Dutchman or Irishman or, or Portuguese, it is important that we can uphold the European Union as a whole and th that the risk of it falling apart, we, we have seen Brexit. Um, I think all of us have, have parties that, of course in democracy, uh, um, it is important that people can form the party to their liking, but we have parties challenging uh, the cooperation and that we as politicians are able to show them that we have a brittle construction and a very valuable construction in this European Union. And therefore this whole rule of law is also important to the average Portuguese or Dutch citizen. Well, maybe a lengthy answer, but from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much, but perhaps, uh, yes, Mr. Pine, yeah, please. Thank you. Maybe to follow up on the, the point uh, made by Minister Block, um, I think uh, in the end, uh, the, the future, or the, the conference about the future of Europe should not be there to start discussing things which are sort of the principles of the EU. So I would be uh, very cautious about that, but maybe it would be a very nice starting point to start communicating more about the consequences if we do not uphold these principles. And for an average citizen, as I think has been said by all of us, um, it, it, it is hard to oversee the consequences, what happens over the longer term when we do not uphold those principles. And um, I think therefore it is, uh, it is very necessary to, to look again at the, at the Commission but also at the member states to ensure that, that these principles are upheld because that is also what citizens expect. And uh, even in those countries which challenge from a cultural perspective, perhaps certain decisions in the, uh, which have been taken in the EU, if, if you look well at, at all the surveys which, uh, which have been uh, taken, the issue of the rule of law is not one of those issues. And I think it is, that is a crucial fact to take into consideration. So maybe that is the, the issue we need to really communicate better on. Sorry, Thank you very I... much. Please, uh, Professor Caroline, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Just to, I suppose, echo the fact, um, as other panelists have said, that to some extent, the rule of law can seem somewhat um, abstract to people. But I think one of the, um, advantages you would like of the difficulties or challenges we've had through COVID is that people have seen very clearly um, how the absence of adherence to the rule of law can affect them very directly. So in cases where there has been, if you like, overstepping of powers, whether by policing or very a lack of clarity in terms of whether people were free to engage in certain activities, that brought very close to home to people you like the importance of the foundations and the rules which we need to apply in our in our countries. So I think by utilizing some of the experience and some of the mistakes that have been made in the past, we might in fact be able to have a dialogue about why these seemingly abstract concepts are actually so vital in terms of how we are free to go about our everyday lives, whether it is attending um, a religious service or um, being free to leave our homes. And those kind of issues are very important to people. And perhaps they don't really see that these are related also to the rule of law and to the adherence of our governments and our states to the rule of law, the requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Perhaps, please, Mrs. Berber. Thank you very much. And um, I think just, yes, also just to, to echo, I think um, as Minister Block said, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy for people to really understand uh, what it all means and, and why they should participate in this conference on the future of Europe. And um, I think even, even for organizations like, like my own uh, that are based in Brussels and, and really understand the EU uh, rather well, um, 
it has remained a little unclear on how we can really uh, participate and what is the best way to put forward our calls on how we see the future of Europe. And as Pepin said, definitely it should be very clear that, that the values that we've all agreed upon are not up for discussion and that we can't go back um, and, and, and lower the expectations of the EU. We should rather find ways to strengthen it and how can we ensure um, that we no longer have these, these horrible setbacks that we've been seeing in the past years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Dulce Lopes, please. Well, thank you very much for the question. It's really important. Uh, there has been an effort, as you already know, in, um, in opening up platforms for the conference on the future of Europe where people can, and citizens and organizations can have their say, as is a common trend and almost, I should say, almost as a good administration principle within the EU. But we have to go further than that. So we need to say, where is the EU headed? Also, it, taking into consideration those participations and also say clearly, where should, where can the, the, the European Union go? So I think it, we will have a great deal of participations. I am hopeful. And some of them will be uh, maybe not, they should not be uh, followed. And this must be, um, I think, clear from the results of the consideration of such participations. I think participation is not just a mean of introducing new elements into the conversation. We should really consider them, but at the end we should, that's the decision making power. We should say, where is the EU headed? with uh, as a result of this conference and regarding the, um, the, the 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 idea that uh, well people most of the people see this as very general concepts and then do, they don't integrate them fully into their day-to-day -day life unless they are individually or collectively affected by those problems uh, i'm a lawyer i'm not a communication expert but but i always thought that would be very interesting to have like a minute in a day that would be um, visually as a minute without the European Union. What would it be? Because most of my students have no idea. They are very young. They have no idea of what we've gained with the European Union. And I think something, a communication strategy more visually attractive that appeals to the heart and to the head, of course, they are always together, but just shows them how, uh, how, how long and deep we've gone with our common concerns and common values and what we will endanger if we lose them. Thank you. Together. Thank you very much. More questions? Please, we have here another one. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Oskar Okros. I'm a State Secretary for EU Affairs uh, in Hungary. And uh, um, I understand we're already behind the schedule and I do not wish to exploit uh, the hospitality of the Portuguese presidency with a long intervention. Just a very quick remark on the interventions by the uh, Amnesty International and the uh, uh, Helsinki Committee. Uh, I honestly would have really been interested in the opinion of both civil society organizations on what role they envisage for the civil society uh, in upholding the uh, principles of uh, rule of law. However, uh, to my understanding, we heard uh, little uh, on their uh, opinions or recommendations uh, to that effect. However, uh, we, uh, in both interventions, uh, heard uh, mentioning uh, and requesting uh, more uh, vigorous uh, stepping up against two member states in specific, one of them being Hungary. And uh, both uh, cases uh, without uh, specific uh, mentioning or uh, underpinning uh, the statements and vague accusations such as uh, rapidly det deteriorating was uh, one of them or uh, terrible situation in the country uh, for uh, the lack of uh, uh, any uh, specific fact uh, underpinning these uh, statements I consider them to be uh, political opinions for which we are all welcome to express 
uh, but uh, I find it necessary uh, to underline to uh, uh, deal with these as such. However, you mentioned both of you specific examples of uh, campaigns and awareness raising actions uh, in Hungary, if uh, I'm not mistaken, which uh, uh, to my understanding proves uh, the opposite of uh, what was uh, uh, meant to express here, namely that uh, both the uh, Amnesty International, the Hungarian uh, Organization of Amnesty and the Helsinki Committee Budapest uh, are part uh, and two of the uh, more than 60,000 uh, civil society organizations in Hungary that operate freely and without uh, any kind of uh, blockade. And so uh, keep up the good work and we wish you all the best for your uh, awareness actions and campaigns. Uh, and should there be any specific uh, concerns with regard to the uh, role and situation of uh, the uh, civil society in Hungary, we of course, as always, stand at your disposal. Uh, at any uh, suitable fora to discuss the situation in an objective, non-political manner with uh, applying the same standards as to all member states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think this, this was a question particularly addressed to Dr. De Pine and to Dr. Berbers. So if you, if you can answer, thank you. Sure, I'll uh, be glad to answer that. Um, I'll be happy to share my uh, my notes with you, and so you can read them again. Uh, but uh, allow me also to underline that I think it is because of the fact that um, Hungary and Poland are still members of the EU that my colleagues in both um, Warsaw and Budapest, and but also in the in the rural areas, uh, are still able to function as civil society organizations. Because if I understand well the proposals which have been put forward by the Hungarian government on the Lex NGO, for instance. Uh, this would have been uh, far harder. Uh, so that's why I would like to keep it. Thank you. I think, um, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this. I'm, I'm not sure it really was a question, but I think um, we, we really, we don't have enough time. To, to list all the evidence that we have available to show the, the threats that we mentioned in our interventions. I think there we have written many reports, many, uh, many um, documents are available that I can share with everybody, but I think we all know what the situation is uh, in, in these two countries and it does not actually need to be repeated in this uh, short period of time that we have here. I'd just like to stress that um, the, the, the remark to say that that our colleagues in, in Hungary operate freely uh, among this wide range of, of civil society organizations, so that is uh, really not uh, true. We have, um, as also the European Union has, has confirmed, the European Commission has started a number of infringement proceedings against oppressive laws that make it very difficult for critical organizations to do their work. There is ample evidence that these organizations are being harassed legally obstructed and for now fortunately indeed not yet criminally prosecuted but you have made this possible with the the law in the stop service package so i think i will just leave it there because i think everybody knows what the real situation is and we do not need to repeat that thank you very much thank you very much uh, i'm afraid that um our, our time is coming to an end. We, we began a little <laughs> late, but uh, I, I've been told that our time um, is scarcer <laughs> than I, I thought it, it was. So I have uh, to thank very much our interlocutors, all those who are here present, and all those we are present in, in another way at distance. It was uh, an immense privilege uh, uh, to share this se session. Thank you. Thank you very much. The conference will continue after a short break. To exit the room, please follow the instructions of the hosts and hostesses and remain in your seat until your row is colored. Exit will start from the back rows.
The session will start in minutes. We now welcome to the stage Professor Paulo Pinto de Albuquerque, who will be conducting a discussion on the role of domestic and international courts as standard setting institutions and conflict resolution adjudicators. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, my guests, my dear guests, for being here, uh, those that are here physically and those that are remotely connected to us. Uh, we are indeed uh, in this uh, second panel discussing about the, the role of the European and national courts and particularly the role of the European Court of Justice and the European Court uh, of Human Rights. I have the pleasure of having here uh, right next to me uh, my president, if I may call him that way, uh, Robert Spano, president of the European Court of Human Rights, he is uh, a professor at Reykjavik University, a former ombudsman of Iceland, uh, elected uh, to the court, to the European Court in 2013, and then elected uh, initially as section president and uh, vice president, and finally in May 2020, President of the European Court of Human Rights. Dear Robert, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, Professor Albuquerque, former Judge Albuquerque, it's a great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, to be with you here today at this high-level conference discussing an issue of fundamental concern for uh, the EU legal order and also for the, the, the legal order of the Council of Europe. It's a great pleasure to be here it physically and not have to do one more of the online events, which have become a very much a part of our lives uh, this past few years. We are all well aware of the context in which this conference takes place. 
uh, with recent examples of challenges to the rule of law and judicial independence in what the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, uh, Madame Buric, has recently called democratic backsliding in her recently published report. This is, of course, at a level of the courts evidenced by litigation before the, the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union. Accordingly, I would like to define the question we are to answer as follows. What role can international courts play in upholding the core principle of the rule of law in the current political climate? I think there are four ways in which the courts, in particular international courts, deal with that issue. The first I would call the role of articulating the legal definition of the rule of law and judicial independence. The second, the role of the gradual application within the rights sphere, the fundamental rights uh, uh, edifice of the rule of law. The third is the role of structural harmony between international courts and judicial dialogue. And the fourth way is our roles in securing effective implementation and execution. Let me now very briefly mention and elaborate on these four manifestations of our roles. The European Court of Human Rights upholds the principle of the rule of law uh, through various substantive guarantees which the court has inferred from this notion. These include the principle of legality or foreseeability, the principle of legal certainty, the principle of equality of individuals before the law, the principle of control of executive power whenever a public freedom is at stake, which is incredibly important and manifesting readily in the pandemic-related environment, the principle of the possibility of a remedy before an, inter, uh, before an independent court and the right to a fair trial. The core of all of these elements and the fundamental ideological value of the rule of law is the protection of the individual from arbitrariness in relation between the state and the individual. Since the convention system is founded on the principle of subsidiarity, these substantive guarantees are applied by domestic judges. I have called repeatedly the ensemble of international and national judges as the European community of judges, which are the guarantors at the judicial level of the rule of law. Secondly, the role on the, in the gradual application of the rule of law through the development of case law. The complaints brought before the Strasbourg court are often based on the right to a fair trial by, and I quote, an independent and impartial tribunal established by law under Article 6.1. But we also see judicial independence being threatened by detention of judges, which are then brought under Article 5, deprivations of liberty, dismissals and even demotions of judges dealt with under Article 8, the right to privacy, and as, as well as freedom of expression when judicial expressions are interfered with by government. Case by case, judgment by judgment, the court has built a substantial arsenal of case law on crucial aspects of judicial independence. As we all know, an efficient, impartial, and independent judiciary is the cornerstone of a functioning system of democratic checks and balances. The judiciary is therefore an essential component of democratic societies and a key institution that needs to be protected. In short, when we are dealing with the issue of the rule of law and judicial independence, we have to realize that judicial independence is a foundational issue. It is an existential issue. Without independent and impartial courts, the EU legal order cannot function and the Council of Europe convention system cannot function. So we are, we are, we are partaking in an existential debate about core principles. My third point deals with the role of international courts in securing harmony, structural and substantive harmony in their case laws. 
we underline here the quality and importance of judicial dialogue between the Strasbourg and Luxembourg courts on rule of law issues. And I'm particularly pleased to be, albeit virtually, sharing this stage with my counterpart, President Kuhn Lennertz of the European Court of Justice. The Court of Justice has in recent years, as we all know, rendered important rulings in the field of judicial independence under the Treaty on European Union and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The jurisprudential core of many of these rulings relies upon Strasbourg case law, and inversely, our case law, Strasbourg case law, relies upon the findings of the Luxembourg court. Now, this is self-evidence as a jurisprudential starting point. Now, why is that? That is because there is a clear symmetry of values between the two systems. This is the case beside the procedural differences between cases brought to uh, the European courts. Uh, the Strasbourg court deals with issues directly brought factually by applications by individuals, whereas the rule of law issues raised before the Luxembourg court are usually done by way of references for preliminary rulings and in infringement proceedings. So before the Strasbourg court, the individual applicants are the directly affected parties to domestic proceedings. But yet, the two systems are evidently complementary and mutually reinforcing. The constellation of values underpinned in Article 2 TEU is, is, are exactly the same as the, the constellation, the parallel universe of values which underpin the Council of Europe system. So the 27 and the 47 are together part and parcel of what the Strasbourg court has explained is a European public order where the rule of law and judicial independence are fundamental components. My fourth and final point focuses on the implementation of judgments of the courts uh, and how this contributes in a very concrete way to upholding the rule of law. In a state governed by the rule of law, final and binding judgments of legally constituted courts must be executed without exceptions. It is clear politicians cannot decide which judgments they will want to execute or not. They should be executed. This applies under Article 46 of the European Convention on Human Rights, also to judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, when it comes to the implementation of judgments, it is important to realize that in a state governed by the rule of law, we are building ourselves on the edifice of the separation of powers. Each of the powers in a constitutional democracy have their assigned roles. And that, of course, means that each of these powers cannot overstep the bounds of their proper roles. The European Court of Human Rights plays a crucial role in upholding, as I mentioned, key rule of law principles through its developed and developing jurisprudence. We will now are in the process of reinforcing that with our new case processing strategy, which aims to target what we have called impact cases, which raise often rule of law issues. Now, when it, the principle of subsidiarity means that these principles are then applied at the level of the domestic courts, demonstrating the full extent of the reach of Strasbourg case law. This is a multi-level system of enforcement. Let me, however, finally conclude with this. We can't, however, rely solely on the courts to solve the rule of law challenges we are witnessing. The judiciary cannot protect, prevent, strengthen the rule of law alone. A true human rights culture, and this goes back to the panel we just heard, a true rule of law culture cannot be sustained in the long run by a top-down imposition of legal norms that do not resonate in contemporary societies. Human rights must exist in the hearts and minds of peoples and their representatives in communal life. A pervasive rule of law and human rights culture must exist not just within the judiciary, but also, and maybe more importantly, in parliaments, in civil society, at the grassroots level. And so the way forward 
is, as mentioned before, and I, I say this as an international judge in this field, with a multi-stakeholder, bilateral, multilateral discussion on the fundamentals of the rule of law. It's through joined and joined up action that we uphold the principle of the rule of law. Thank you very much indeed. We are now uh, supposed, yes, we have. Uh, we have with us also uh, the great pleasure of, of having with us uh, Kun Leonards, um, President of the European Court of Justice. Uh, having served 14 years at the Court of First Instance, he became judge at the Court of Justice in 2003, then uh, President of Chamber, Vice President, and since 2015, uh, President of the European Court of Justice. Dear President uh, Leonards, it's a pleasure to have uh, you with us. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Professor Pinto Albuquerque. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this conference and in particular to address you in the present session on the role of European and national courts for upholding the rule of law. As you're all aware, during recent years, an increasing number of cases relating directly to the rule of law have arrived in the docket of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Most of these cases have come to us by way of requests by national courts for a preliminary ruling on the interpretation of EU law. These cases exemplify the way in which EU law is generally applied in practice, namely, for the most part, by the national courts, which are closest to the facts. Only where there is a doubt as to the meaning or validity of EU law, does the Court of Justice come into play. In order to guarantee the uniform interpretation and application of the legal rules and the fundamental values we share, the member states have vested in one single judicial body, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the task of interpreting EU law and of ruling on its validity. This mechanism is based not on hierarchy, but on mutual assistance. It is a system of dynamic judicial cooperation where different yet complementary tasks are allocated between the Court of Justice and national courts on the basis of mutual respect and mutual trust. As it happens, the first of the recent rule of law cases was submitted to the Court of Justice by a Portuguese court, namely the Supremo Tribunal Administrativo. Members of another Portuguese court, the Tribunal de Contas, were contesting temporary salary reductions that had been implemented as part of general cuts in public spending. The plaintiffs argued that those salary reductions threatened their judicial independence. In its landmark judgment, Associação Sindical dos Juízes Portugueses of 2018, the Court of Justice recalled that the European Union is a union based on the rule of law. It held that every member state must ensure that any of its courts which may be called upon to apply EU law are independent in order to be able to provide effective judicial protection in the field of EU law. The Court of Justice explained the concept of independence as follows. It presupposes in particular that the body concerned exercises its judicial functions wholly autonomously Externally, its members must be protected against interventions or pressure which might influence their decisions. Internally, courts are to be impartial, meaning 
that they must not favor any of the parties before them. As interpreted by the Court of Justice, the rule of law within the EU does not prescribe a single particular constitutional model. It allows room for diversity, provided that the basic tenets of any democratic society are respected. That view is shared by the European Court of Human Rights, and we just heard it from my good friend and colleague, Robert Spano. That is why one year after the judgment Association Syndical des Juices Portugueses was delivered, in the AK judgment concerning the independence of the disciplinary chamber of the Polish Supreme Court, the Court of Justice referred extensively to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, in which that court highlighted that what is at stake with judicial independence is the confidence which the courts in a democratic society must inspire. That confidence may be undermined not only by constitutional or legislative changes that are at odds with judicial independence, but also by the context that led to those changes. That is why both courts favor a contextual approach according to which judicial independence is protected both in law and in fact. In the very recent judgment, Republica, a case concerning judicial independence in Malta, the Court of Justice also followed this contextual approach. It examined whether there are objective circumstances capable of giving rise to legitimate doubts in the minds of the citizens as to the imperviousness of the courts concerned to external factors and their neutrality with respect to the interests before them. These cases provide a classic example of the judicial cooperation between national courts and the Court of Justice that takes place by means of the preliminary ruling mechanism. It also shows how this mechanism helps to guarantee common minimum standards of judicial protection through independent courts and thus to uphold the rule of law. For without judicial independence, the rule of law is meaningless in practice. Judicial independence is also the, the basis of mutual trust without which the European Union as a union of law and an area without internal frontiers could not exist. Given the importance of the preliminary ruling mechanism in this context, the Court of Justice emphasized in its Miastowowicz judgment of last year that national judges are free to refer questions to the Court of Justice that is also questions relating to judicial independence and the rule of law. The preliminary ruling mechanism is of course not the only procedural route available for guaranteeing respect for EU law and for the rule of law more generally. The EU treaties have empowered the commission as the guardian of those treaties to oversee the proper application of EU law and to bring infringement proceedings before the Court of Justice against the member state that it considers to be in breach of it. In addition to the cases I have already mentioned, the Court of Justice has been seized by the Commission in matters concerning respect for the rule of law. Indeed, infringement proceedings are ultimately the appropriate means for ensuring the correct implementation of judgments delivered by the Court of Justice in preliminary ruling procedures, where necessary, as those judgments form part of EU law. To conclude, I would like to mention once again the European Court of Human Rights, which also strongly engages, as we just heard, in upholding the rule of law. Given the threefold protection that exists in the European Union through national courts, 
the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, I am confident that the rule of law will continue to be protected within the European legal space. I am very much looking forward to our discussion and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, dear President Leonard. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome President Antonio Joaquim Pissarra, President of the Supreme Court of Justice of Portugal. Caro Presidente uh, Antonio Joaquim Pissarra, é um gosto uh, tê-lo entre nós. Great pleasure to have you with us, sir. Even though you're going to be uh, beamed in remotely, you have the floor. Não sei se me está a ouvir. Estou a ouvir, muito obrigado. Yes, I think I can hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Albuquerque. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to start by congratulating the Portuguese presidency, represented by the uh, Minister of Justice. Thank you to her and the presidency for organizing this conference. And I'm very honored to be invited to take part in this conference. I'd just like to pay tribute to the illustrious members of the panel and welcome uh, them, the uh, moderator and the audience. It's an honor for me to um, take part in this conference on the rule of law. And uh, do so under the aegis of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. It's a particular honor for me to be taking part in this uh, panel on the role to be played by courts, be they national or international, in defending and developing the rule of law. The rule of law has to be defended and is sustained in courts. And as the title of this panel implies, it is the courts who are the uh, final uh, instance uh, who actually guarantee the rule of law. Whether we're talking about uh, disputes or um, bodies which are established with um, uh, case law, whether it sets uh, interpretative standards, it is always in the courts, be they national or international, that the rule of law is guaranteed. Now, before going on to deal with a number of topics. I would just like to uh, beg your understanding uh, for the fact that I'm not actually physically present in the St. Francis convent in uh, Coimbra. I would just like to say that I actually have a, a, a home in uh, Coimbra and I'll be coming home there tomorrow, but I'm sorry I can't be there today. And I assure you that the fact that I'm not there physically is uh, not because I show any disrespect to uh, the participants or the importance of this event. I'm uh, nearing the end of my mandate as president of the Supreme uh, Court. I'm um, 70 tomorrow. And uh, according to the Portuguese uh, law applicable, I have to um, hand over my uh, functions and there will be an electoral process to select a successor. And it's only because of that uh, reason that I absolutely have to be here in Lisbon today, because I have to complete my final tasks, my final obligations, and uh, complete any outstanding matters. But I wanted to be present, present as, I, as much as I could, uh, out of respect for the topics, the panelists, and for the presidency, Portuguese presidency of the council. That being said, I'd just like to um, share a couple of um, personal comments, which I think that are really relevant on the whole issue of um, the rule of law in Europe and how it should be implemented properly in the courts. The first topic I wanted to touch upon is basically something which came to mind because of the makeup of this panel. I'm sorry, we've lost the image and the sound. We've lost the connection to Lisbon, I'm afraid. Sorry, we missed that bit. The fact that we have the uh, presidents of the uh, 
Supreme Court of uh, the country holding the presidency of the European Union and the presidents of the uh, European Court of Human Rights and the uh, the European Court of Justice, I think does uh, characterize the importance of this um, topic, this debate. It's the whole issue of trying to harmonize guidelines and uh, criteria for judgments at European level. Now, that sounds simple when you just say it, but it's not at all easy. It's not straightforward. It's not good enough to argue that the place where decisions should be taken uh, should be the ECJ or the ECHR and that they should take decisions and judgments which would be in line uh, with the national uh, judgments and vice versa. This is not the way it works out in practice as we know. Now we don't have time to go into depth into the reasons why there are difficulties in having a uniform approach, but I think we can set out the basic central reasons for that. It is difficult to have a uniform application of uh, the rule of law, the law applicable to the rule of law throughout the judicial network in Europe. And it, um, it's reflected um, in the political difficulties of uh, rolling out the European project. There is a interdependence between the national and international uh, courts. And we're not just talking about the uh, European institutions, such as the uh, European Court of Justice, but also the European Court of uh, Human Rights. And there is a distance between uh, them and the national courts. And we're not talking about just physical distance. We're talking about distance uh, between the decision makers. Each decision maker is in, in their own sphere, in their own little world, and they tend not to take any notice of people in other spheres. It's very often um, the fact that people point fingers at the states or national decision makers when they're talking about implementing European laws. And um, this is a problem. In Portugal, uh, where we have um, a centralized uh, justice uh, system, what happens at European level doesn't count very much. Over 90% are really decided at national level. There's not much pay attention paid to uh, European jurisprudence or European case law. So we really have to make a massive effort in terms of training and preparation, but particularly it's a matter of a mindset, a legal mindset and culture if we're to ensure that uh, national judges really feel themselves to be truly European uh, judges. But this is a failing which isn't just at European level, if you'll allow me to say this. There is obviously a major problem there. But European bodies, European institutions also have a role to play, play in bringing those two levels together. Obviously, naturally, um, the um, European level is the, the summit of the decision-making process. But I think more could be done, both at the level of the European Court of Justice and indeed uh, elsewhere in the European Court of Human Rights uh, to ensure that there is a more uniform and across-the-board acceptance of um, European Jews uh, case law at national level. So we do have to make an effort. And how can we do this? Well, obviously, in terms of communications, we could do more and we could do better. But there is a point which I think is probably the most controversial thing. I think something could be done to ensure that um, international case law does take more account of the sensitivities of individual legal communities in, um, in Europe. It's very important that European decision makers understand, and I'm sure many do, they have to understand that the European project tends to go at different speeds. There are values which are universal, the basic values which underlie the um, building of Europe, and those are sacrosanct. Anybody who does not comply with those values cannot stay within the European Union. 
And as far as that central matrix is concerned, I think European um, bodies, European institutions have worked very clearly. But beyond that central core, there's all the uh, case law, all the jurisprudence that is developing, which um, comes into European laws. And here we have to um, have more involvement in the European project. And we also have to look at the European Court of Human Rights and take, making progress on respect of human rights in Europe. Both of those courts, the ECJ and the ECHR, have a role to uh, draw um, the rule, rule of law ahead. Obviously, there is a role for national courts and civil society. But um, the uh, European institutions, because they're drawing the rest along, have to make sure that they're very careful about the way uh, they do this. If they pull people too far, too quickly, then neither the courts nor the people can really understand that. They can't take it on board. And um, it may be that there is some kind of um, uh, resistance as a result. And European institutions will they'll, um, then cease to be respected uh, as a reference point, as they should be. So you have to be careful the way you push people or pull people in a particular way. So I think that's that's where the value of um, European decisions might lie. If they are to be respected and obeyed, you have to try to understand the reality of uh, individual national courts and the, the reality they are working in. And there you have to have the right balance between very progressive or very conservative. Europe is a very sensitive um, animal. And if uh, European institutions are not comprehensible, not understandable, uh, the various different corners of Europe, which is such a multifaceted uh, shape, a multifaceted faceted, uh, creature, then it'll be very difficult. And that's why you may see the European project uh, begin to fail. So that was the first topic that I wanted to share with you. And that is that uh, European case law, be it from the European Court of Justice or the uh, European Court of Human Rights, are fundamental instruments for trying to uh, take a more uniform approach and to and develop the rule of law at European level. And it's um, very important that we uh, look at each other, compare each other, so that we, uh, and what's happening, so that the um, European judiciary and uh, national judiciary are looking at each other and learning from each other. The second topic is more uh, forward-looking. And I'd like to encourage a discussion about where we should be going in terms of building Europe at a judicial level. We know that... Um, the justice system is, uh, is part of the whole system of sovereignty. And when we're talking about approximation of judicial system, we have to be very careful in terms of uh, sovereignty. And we have to concentrate on the uh, principal legal instruments, treaties, regulations, and directives. The logic so far has been a matter of deepening judicial cooperation. And a lot has been done. A lot has been done to bring um, the rules together. And at the level of the judiciary, a lot has been done to create common rules, common regulations when we're talking about judicial cooperation. Uh, from recognition and transmission of uh, judicial acts and obtaining evidence uh, across the board. And when we're looking at uh, recognition and enforcement of decisions, judgments and orders issued by member states, uh, we have made significant progress there as well. The question now is really where we're going from here. Where should we go? This is an area, as I said, which touches on sovereignty. So a common project for the judiciary would clearly be part of a federalist or proto-federalist European project. Sorry, we've lost the picture and the sound again. 
the regras processuais. If we're looking at um, procedural rules at civil and uh, criminal uh, level, we have to see how we can approach this. How can we look at uh, European rules? It's not, not very easy to uh, apply them uh, directly. And it's not that easy to create uh, digital platforms, which would be a common approach to uh, proceedings or ensuring that there is compatibility uh, between national digital platforms. But I think we do need to work on those things. Those will be vital if we're going to ensure that we can implement the European project at the level of the judiciary. But what I'd like to leave um, very clear in, on this topic is what I think is a very clear reality. Uh, harmonization approximation in Europe does involve much greater integration for nas the national judiciaries, the national courts. And that will mean that we'll have to go beyond pure cooperation. Uh, we need to move towards far more and more widely used common instruments the efficacy and respect of national decisions uh, really require uh, that to be the case. And this is going to be a very significant challenge. It's a challenge to find um, sustainable ways of doing this in practice. And it's even more difficult to ensure that we have complete integrity and independence of the judiciary in all member states. Trust and respect for decisions at European level require us to be absolutely certain without reservation that these decisions come from completely independent courts, which only uh, obey the law. Today and forever, that is the key systemic issue. Rule of law, the independence of the courts, are two face two sides of the same coin. So the problem is clear. Basically, if we do not, if we do have states which do not respect that independence of courts, how can we have a trust in judicial cooperation at a European level? If there is no respect for that judicial cooperation, and what can we do at European level to ensure that those principles are respected? So there are two questions I'd like to leave you with there, and I hope you've, uh, you've um, taken those on board. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, dear President. Um, as previous speakers, uh, you were focusing on, on the two sides of the same coin, uh, judicial independence and the rule of law. Uh, and, and the point that you wanted to make uh, has already also been stressed by, by other speakers, the need for harmonization of the case law, uh, especially uh, when, when dealing with issues related to the rule of law. Uh, I have now the pleasure to welcome Caroline Edstadler, Federal Minister for EU and Constitution at the Federal Chancery of Austria, former member of the European Parliament, and also uh, someone whom I met, whom I had the pleasure of meeting at uh, the European Court of Human Rights in 2017. We had the pleasure of talking about uh, the case law of the, of the court at that time. Um, um, the now Minister uh, of, of EU and Constitution was working at uh, the Austrian division of the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you for being with us. You have the floor, please. Thank you so much, Paolo, for this introduction and thank you for the invitation. I really feel honored to participate in this high level panel. Uh, you mentioned it already, we met before, as I also met some others of you before. That's why I would have been really happy to join you in person. But to be honest, the connections in Europe are still on a pandemic niveau and it's not possible to go back and forth in a short time. So let me first of all send you the warmest regards from rainy and cold Vienna and I really do hope that you have the sun in Coimbra. 
Let's focus now on the topic. Well, rule of law, democracy, and human rights are the core values on which the European Union is founded. The rule of law is a concept of universal validity and one of the founding values shared between the member states of the European Council, which was founded even earlier than the European Union. Our grandfathers, our fathers' generations, they founded it to avoid and to, to, uh, to avoid war and to guarantee peace and to foster the cooperation between states within Europe and operate on the same level of values. And that was already mentioned by so many of you. These values are the cornerstones of Europe as such, describing the common values of modern democratic states with, with well-functioning institutions. That is why I am so keen on safeguarding these values, establishing mechanisms such as the new rule of law mechanism by the European Commission to learn from each other, to copy best practice models in Europe and to develop a modern state all over, all to enabling peace and stability in Europe. For me, as a former criminal judge, access to justice is really crucial. As a former international expert at the European Court of Human Rights in 2016 and 17, I had the chance to work at that great, really great court, a court that guarantees same standards all over Europe based on our common understanding of human rights enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights. A court, court which has not only an outstanding architecture and is widely known as a flagship, but a court that is also a best practice model, I would say, for the world, which gives the rule of law a real meaning. Another very important institution is the Venice Commission. In March 2016, they adopted the rule of law checklist, considering three things. First of all, that the notion of the rule of law requires a system of certain and foreseeable law. Secondly, that everyone has the right to be treated by all decision makers with dignity, equality, and rationality, and in accordance with the law. And thirdly, that everyone has the opportunity to challenge decisions before independent and impartial courts through fair procedures. In my speech today, I would like to focus on this last aspect, the access to justice before independent and impartial courts, including judicial review uh, of uh, administrative acts, is one of the cornerstones of the rule of law. Judicial independence and impartiality means objective procedures for judicial appointments, TINA, discipline and removals enshrined in the constitution law or any other texts in that level. This reflects the professional position of the individual judges, as well as questions of financial autonomy of the judiciary as a whole and with sufficient court resources. Also, that was already mentioned by the president of the European Court of Justice. Ideally, national courts act as independent and impartial arbitrators, something we will agree on. The difficulties, however, are in the details of the practical cases. Nothing can illustrate this better than a look at the interpretation given by the European Court of Justice, serving as guidance to the member states of the European Union, or the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, setting international standards with respect to the fair trial. The role of the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, and the national courts, as well as the interaction between, between them, is of a paramount importance. It was very interesting for me serving as a national criminal judge first and then having also the view from the international court, the European Court of Human Rights. As a criminal judge, you always have the human rights aspect of the cases in your head, but then you have the even broader view if you're working in Strasbourg. It was of particular importance for me to have all the discussions with colleagues from several member states of the Council of Europe, and you mentioned one of the discussions uh, we had quite at the beginning of my time there. Human rights and rule of law have to be our common ground. And of course, from a national point of view, it can be quite painful to get a judgment from Strasbourg or from Luxembourg. 
which shows up deficiency in a case or rather in a system. But it is what guarantees the high standards we wish to fulfill. This is what we work for as lawyers, as judges, and also as politicians. I'm now in the second governmental post. I was elected member of the European Par Parliament. You mentioned that also for only six months, but it gave me a big insight. And I have always been advocating for strong institutions and a good access to justice. Before coming to an end, I would like um, to bring one additional thought in a discussion, and this is the accession process regarding the Western Balkan countries, especially North Macedonia and Albania. Why? Because it is crucial to set an incentive to continue the path of the rule of law. This is currently happening, for example, by reforms demanded in the vetting process for judges in order to become a member of the European Union, in order to fulfill our standards. The alternative means risking to lose them in our attempt for stability and peace. And one politician in Albania and in North Macedonia, I am not quite sure where it was, uh, he expressed it in a way that he said, we are losing political oxygen if we are not allowed to enter the next level of the accession process. That is what I mean when I'm talking about the rule of law, which we have to safeguard and promote and also to export to the world. I'm very thankful for all the experience I was able to gain at the European Court of Human Rights. And on the other hand, I do understand from a national perspective that it is sometimes really painful to get judgments and uh, to be assessed externally. On the other hand, I think also international courts need the full acceptance of uh, their member states that we can really have the best of the rule of law we can have. It is worth fighting for that because the rule of law, democratic institutions uh, and the human rights, they guarantee us freedom, peace and prosperity in Europe. And therefore, we all have to work and I'm doing that. Thank you so much and greetings from Vienna. Thank you, dear Caroline. Uh, you have stressed an extremely important point, which is uh, about uh, the, the um, access to, to, to justice and access to uh, international courts as, as the core value of the uh, European human rights uh, protection system. Uh, I have now uh, the pleasure of welcoming uh, Frank Clark, um, Chief Justice of Ireland and President of the Supreme Court of Ireland since 2017. Uh, he is now um, Vice President of the Network of Presidents of the Supreme Judicial Courts in Europe and is talking to us in that capacity. You have the floor, Mr. Clark. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And can I start by saying that uh, President Limburg, President of the Bundesgerichtshof, and also president of the Network of Presidents, uh, is very regretful that she cannot be here today, but has asked me to represent the network uh, at this very important conference. Um, as has been pointed out in both sessions, there are many aspects uh, to the protection of the rule of law. But as the title of this particular session emphasizes, courts, whether national or international, do play a central, although not an exclusive role. And I suggest that easy access to courts which have the effective power uh, to enforce rights and obligations is an essential part of maintaining the rule of law. I would like to concentrate on a small number of themes which are of particular relevance to national courts, uh, but in so doing I would not like in any way uh, to suggest that I do not fully endorse the role of international courts as has in particular been emphasized by both President Lennertz and President Spano. And I would say that the constellation of which President Spano spoke uh, applies equally to national courts. And I think it is also fair to say that the case law of both the Strasbourg and the Luxembourg court uh, have increasingly found a place in the development by national courts of their own legal order. And um, so far as national courts are concerned, I might start with the old saying that justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done. 
public confidence in the existence of fair, uh, competent and impartial courts, can I suggest, is a central tenet of the maintenance of confidence in the rule of law. And uh, as was pointed out earlier, it's not just a matter of courts operating in a fair way. It is civil society, uh, the political system, recognising that and therefore public confidence in the importance of the rule of law in each member state is, is I think, a, a core a value that needs to be maintained. Because it is national courts, as President Pizarro pointed out, uh, that are at the coalface of dealing with the ordinary issues that are of concern to citizens, particularly those who may have a conflict either with the nationally powerful or, or with the state itself. And it is the perception of the public uh, of how the rule of law operates in national courts, uh, which emphasize to that public either the strength or otherwise of, of the rule of law in any state. And as maintenance of that public confidence is by no means automatic, I think it is important that we develop mechanisms to identify problems uh, so as to be able to put ourselves in a position to take remedial action where necessary. Um, I very much welcomed the emphasis placed by President Lennertz on the contextual nature of uh, assessing whether there, whether there is, is adequate, adequate uh, compliance, uh, compliance with the rule of law, that it's that necessary, necessary to look, to look both at the law and the facts. Uh, I think we could all identify systems where it is possible that on paper they look perfect, but where no one would regard them as working well in practice. And equally, there are systems which do work well in practice, even though a theoretical analysis of, of the paper structure might not suggest that that would be so. Uh, and therefore, I think it is important that the com complexity of maintenance of the rule of law is recognized and that it doesn't become a sort of a box ticking exercise or an exercise where we attempt to uh, reduce matters to almost a numerical calculation. Uh, as someone whose undergraduate degree is in mathematics, I have great respect uh, for attempting to do things by numbers but the rule of law is not something which can be dealt with in that way. And I think, as has been pointed out by speakers before, the EU has a diverse legal and social set of cultures. And the public confidence of which I spoke, it seems to me, requires that the public of each member state, with their own history of legal and social culture, can feel respect for the rule of law. Um, cultures differ significantly. Um, I might just give one recent example of relevance from Ireland. As many will know, there are significant differences as to the extent to which the identity of persons involved in legal proceedings are, are revealed. Uh, some countries, such as Germany, have a very strict regime whereby very little reference uh, is made publicly to those who are involved in cases. Uh, in the, the common law tradition from where I come, uh, the identity of almost everyone involved with very careful exceptions such as family disputes uh, is readily available. A recent piece of Irish legislation uh, placed a barrier to revealing the names of persons involved in a particular kind of case and that led to a significant public outcry, one which I suspect would not arise in many other countries. And I think it's just an example of how uh, public respect for what is happening in the courts and respect for the rule of law itself can be uh, influenced, influenced by what the, the citizens of each member state are used to. Uh, Irish people not being told about the names of people in a, in a particular court would cause them to feel that that court was operating secretly and not in accordance with the rule of law, even though a similar restriction in other jurisdictions might not lead to anything remotely like such a situation. And that's not to emphasize that one is right or one is wrong, but simply to emphasize uh, the very point made by President Lennertz, that we live in a, in a diverse set of jurisdictions and a, approach to the rule of law must be taken in the context of that diversity, while nonetheless respecting the fundamental values 
which are inherent in the rule of law in whatever uh, state we are involved in. Um, there has been mention already of the need for mutual trust between the courts of member states of the European Union. Um, there are many reasons, uh, not least those of solidarity between judges across the Union, uh, why we should all have uh, an interest in how the rule of law is operating in other member states. However, I think there is one particular issue which is of legitimate concern uh, to the judges of each uh, set of national courts on the issue of mutual trust. On the 10th of January of last year, uh, in the context of issuing a statement concerning uh, events in Poland, the network of presidents said the following, cooperation in the field of justice is largely based on mutual trust in the administration of justice within the EU. And I think that is a vital component of our understanding of the European legal order. We are increasingly called upon uh, to respect decisions made by the courts of other member states. Uh, we direct the surrender of persons who are the subject of European arrest warrants. Uh, we recognize the judgments or stay proceedings on foot of instruments such as the Brussels regulation or the insolvency regulation. And in doing so, we implicitly accept the judgments of the courts that have made those orders, which we are required to accept. And provided that the technical requirements in the legislation are met, the range of circumstances in which it is permissible not to respect those orders is for very good reason, extremely limited. For if it were easy to ignore the orders of other, the courts of other member states, the coherence of the European legal system, judicial system would collapse. But that mutual recognition comes, as I think President Fazzaro pointed out, with a requirement that there be genuine mutual trust. And if I return to the topic of the trust which the citizens of each member state must uh, have in their courts for the rule of law to prosper, if they know that their courts are enforcing or recognizing or respecting judgments of other courts, then that carries with it the need that they also respect the independence, the impartiality, the fairness and the competence of the courts of that other country. If they see the courts of their country enforcing orders which they might consider to be dubious from that perspective, then that not only diminishes the respect for the rule of law in the other country, it diminishes the respect for the rule of law in their own country. Um, and therefore, from the perspective of the citizens of any member state, seeing their courts increasingly uh, recognizing and enforcing judgments of courts of other member states, there is a, a unity of interest in, in respect for the rule of law throughout the Union. Uh, we, we may not always agree with the orders of other courts, uh, no more than I suspect we can't always expect other courts to agree with our orders. This is not about being necessarily correct, and correct can be a matter of opinion in any event in many cases. <laughs> but it is a question of having a sufficient respect in the fairness, impartiality and independence of the court whose order one is being required to respect. So it seems to me from the perspective of national courts that we live in an increasingly intermingled justice system within the European Union. And therefore regard for the rule of law is itself intermingled uh, between the national courts of each member state and the international courts represented uh, very much on this panel. And it therefore follows, it seems to me, that respect for the rule of law is itself increasingly intermingled and is a legitimate concern for all of us. And I look forward to the discussion which will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, dear President uh, Clark. Uh, you were stressing the point that uh, mutual trust is indeed uh, the cornerstone of this uh, European community of judges of which President Spano was, uh, was uh, 
uh, speaking a while ago, uh, and and uh, for that to come to to become a reality, uh, there should be uh, uh, indeed uh, um, a contextual approach to the to the application of, of law, not only to take into account the law in the books, but uh, but also the law in practice, as as indeed was also uh, uh, referred in detail by, by President Leonard. Uh, I have now the pleasure of welcoming Professor, Associate Professor of the Faculty of Law of the University of Coimbra, uh, my dear colleague Pedro Caeiro. Uh, he's also a member of management of the Management Committee of the European Criminal Law Academic Network and a member of the European Commission uh, Expert Group on Criminal Policy. You have the floor, dear Pedro. Obrigado, Sr. Professor Paulo Pinto Albuquerque. Excelências. Thank you, Professor Albuquerque. Excellencies, members of this panel, dear participants, I shall make my presentation in English, but before that, I'd like to thank the, European, the Portuguese Presidency for their invitation to participate in this event. Let me greet Judge Pissarra, who will retire tomorrow, and he was the first judge. I worked with here in Coimbra 20 years ago. I will focus on the rule of law courts and trust in the field of judicial cooperation in criminal matters. Courts play an unparalleled role in the upholding of the rule of law in its substantive dimension. I mean the protection of fundamental rights. My question is, how does trust relate to that function? Is it an obstacle or a driver? What is trust? Trust is a disposition that allows for individuals and social entities to decide in situations of risk and uncertainty when they do not know or cannot control all the factors that might be relevant for taking such a decision. It has a dialogical structure and leads the truster to devalue the risk of adverse consequences through the expectation that the trustee will act in a way that averts them. Trust is a surrogate for knowledge and control. Judicial cooperation can carry adverse consequences from the point of view of the requested state slash truster. If the requesting state slash trustee... Could you speak slow down, please? Could somebody ask the gentleman to slow down a little bit because he's reading very fast? You have taken part in such breach. Trust and distrust help the requested state to screen and fend off unacceptable risks. In its notorious opinion 2, 2013, the Court of Justice has devised a principle of mutual trust as a fundamental principle of EU law, which would embody a duty to presume that, and I quote, all the other member states comply with fundamental rights, end of quote, and by extension with the rule of law. With respect, I am not convinced that trust can be the content of a legal principle because it is something you simply cannot prescribe. A duty to trust is a contradiction in itself, since trust is a subjective disposition even when applied to social entities. You can force someone to marry you, but you, not to love you. Moreover, trust only makes sense when there is risk exposure and distrust is also a viable alternative. A duty to presume compliance with the rule of law is a duty to presume that such risk does not exist, which suppresses the need for risk assessment and trust. Thus, it seems to me that the so-called principle of mutual trust is an inaccurate name for a quite different and more technical mechanism, the establishment of a presumption of compliance with the rule of law by which the courts shall abide in judicial cooperation proceedings. The content of this duty is not to trust, but rather to presume that your counterpart respects the rule of law, which in turn facilitates the recognition of their decisions. It is not only a matter of naming, although names are important since Confucius, but also of making the pieces of the puzzle fit where Somebody they belong. Somebody tell the speaker he's reading too fast. It's impossible to keep up for the interpretation for everybody to be able to understand. And yet, as we will see, trust can still play a role within a system of presumed compliance. The duty to presume compliance is consistent with the project of a single judicial area in which issuing and executing authorities are part of the same cooperation system when they apply EU law. The suppression of risk assessment impacts the dialogical structure inherent to transnational judicial cooperation and approximates its regime to domestic proceedings, 
where there is no place for trust or distrust. At the internal level, the responsibility for adverse consequences may well rest with the competent body, but it is the state as a whole that will be accountable before third parties, such as the individual concerned or the European Convention on Human Rights. The problem is that suppressing the risk assessment does not suppress the risk itself, nor does the concept of a single judicial area change the individual responsibility of the single member states vis-à-vis -vis third parties for the breach of the obligations arising from the European Convention on Human Rights. As a consequence, the adverse results of cooperation, namely the violation of human rights by the issuing state, may still occur and carry the liability of the executing state. In Pirozzi and Castaño, the European Court of Human Rights has made clear that notwithstanding the Bosphorus principle, it will not refrain from adjudicating possible violations of the Convention involving the application of EU law. Therefore, the major shift of direction brought by the Court of Justice in Aranyosi Caldararu and its sequels, namely LM and LNP, by acknowledging that the presumption of compliance with the rule of law may be rebutted in the actual case, deserves to be praised for many reasons. Above all, it allows for more effective protection of fundamental rights. It also reframes the responsibility of national courts for the enforcement of the rule of law while executing foreign warrants and decisions. In the third place, it rehabilitates the proper meaning of trust in cases where cooperation depends on the provision of guarantees by the requesting state, according to the judgments ML and Dorobantu. Finally, with its reinstatement as a valuable asset in cooperation proceedings, trust became a powerful driver for the reform of systemic malpractice by national authorities who will otherwise face the risk of refusal of cooperation from the authorities of fellow member states. It should be stressed that this positive change in the stance of the Court of Justice was not due to any amendment of the existing legislation, but rather to the persistence of national courts, whose references for preliminary rulings involving the protection of fundamental rights in cooperation procedures eventually resonated in the jurisprudence of Luxembourg. Two weeks ago, in the rather unusual Gavanozov case, Advocate General Bobek delivered an opinion that goes along the same lines. The judicial authorities of a member state whose laws do not comply with minimum standards in a particular aspect should not be able to issue requests for cooperation related to that aspect. Otherwise, they will be acting unlawfully and against mutual trust. In my view, deficiencies in the law do not really contend with trust because they can be known and assessed by the other member states. Having said that, there are no reasons not to extend the Advocate General's reasoning to situations where the risk for fundamental rights lies in the practice of the issuing state and therefore require trust. For instance, if the, prison, if the prison conditions in a given member state are in breach of minimum standards, the respective judicial authorities should refrain from issuing a European arrest warrant until they are in a position to guarantee to their counterparts that the risk has been removed. Maybe it should have all started like this. In this way, the need for being trusted will foster the rule of law in a twofold manner. It will prevent the breach of fundamental rights in the actual case at hand, and it will encourage the competent national authorities to implement the required changes in the prison system. In this way, we will finally be, be moving from the respect for the rule of law is not an issue because we trust each other, to we must respect the rule of law in order to be trusted by the others. If I may adapt and conclude William Edward Stemming's aphorism, in God we trust, all others shall bring evidence when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Pedro, for your deconstruction of the concept of mutual trust and, and uh, uh, the uh, the implicit uh, presumption of confidence, uh, and, and, and especially for, for the, the important point that you made the, on, on the, the possibility of rebuttal of this presumption. Um, we have now uh, on the list of our panelists, uh, Pierre-Dominique Choup, uh, Vice President of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. Please, you have the floor. We, 
we are not getting fine, fine, fine. perfect I had to press the button sorry uh, excelências senhores senhores primeiro queria senhor presidente lamentar muito Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd just like to say I'm very sorry that I can't be in Portugal because it's my second homeland. The sound is not very good. Could the gentleman slow down because it's very hard to hear him? The CCB is recognized as the voice of the European legal profession representing through its member more than 1 million European lawyers. Membership of our organization includes the bar and law societies of 45 countries from the European Union, the European Economic Area, Switzerland and wider Europe. The CCB was founded in 1960 and since its creation has been at the forefront of advancing the views of European lawyers and defending the legal principles upon, upon which democracy and the rule of law are based. The most important missions of our organization are the regulation of the profession, the defense of the rule of law, human rights, and democratic values. Several areas of special concern also include the access to justice and the respect for the, rights to the right to defense. As we know, one of the main principles of the rule of law includes an effective judicial protection by independent and partial courts principle amongst others has been recognized by the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. Indeed, the quality, independence and efficiency are the key components for an effective justice system that provides effective judicial protection, a fundamental right of every citizen. When we speak about these key components, it's important to stress that they are relevant not only- The sound is extremely bad and the interpreters cannot interpret properly, so you have to understand if the Portuguese interpreters have to stop. significant. This has been brilliantly presented by the previous in the pre during the previous contributions. My goal today is to stress and underline the irreplaceable role of lawyers for upholding the rule of law and, I will start with that, their role in, uh, in the access to justice. Access to justice constitutes one of the most important pillars of the rule of law. The right of access to justice in a democracy based on the rule of law is inextricably linked to the right of access for lawyers. Lawyers play a fundamental role in the safeguarding of the rule of law because our role is not only to ensure the right to legal advice. So the interpretation into Portuguese will have to stop because we can't hear well enough. And the right to legal aid for any citizen. But also to make lawmakers aware of bad practice and correct injustice by taking cases to court. It is time that this role of the legal profession is recognized for upholding the rule of law without ulterior motives. Lawyers also play a vital role in the practical implementation of EU law. I would like now to refer in more detail to the independence of lawyers as one of the key components of the effective justice. At first, the rule of law requires judicial independence. The independence of lawyers and bars is a part of the independence of the judiciary in general and is closely interlinked with the independence of other actors of the judiciary. The independence of lawyers is necessary to properly defend clients, including in their actions against the state, to protect lawyers from being identified with their clients, to build trust between lawyers and their clients, to preserve the rule of law and to fulfill the important and irreplaceable role to prevent the abuse of powers. On all possible occasions, the CCB stresses the importance for all lawyers to have the independence and freedom to carry out their professional duties without fear and reprisal, hindrance, intimidation and harassment in order to preserve the independence and integrity of the administration of justice and to maintain the rule of law. Especially with regard to the, preven to the prevention of arbitrary decisions and action, it does not only depend on the state's lawmakers to provide for access to justice and the respective legal remedies for their citizens. There is a need to ensure the existence of an independent self-regulated legal profession, which comprises independent lawyers who are independently supervised and who are able and allowed to challenge in courts the decisions taken by those who are in power. 
The CCB fully shares the, the concerns regarding the needs to enhance judicial independence, especially in certain EU member states. In our view, there is a strong need for detailed assessment and discussion on all levels, high, high political level and, and on expert level by citizens about the negative dynamics and trends taking place in our countries, influencing negatively the independence of the courts and independence of the lawyers and the bars as well. Of course, such discussions based on comprehensive analysis should lead to concrete decisions and recommendations bringing positive changes for strengthening the rule of law. The CCB has recently provided its contribution for, for the next annual rule of law report published by the, European uh, by the European Convention. Our input reflects the relevant rule of law developments in new member states identified by our members with particular, with particular focus on developments that undermine the independence of lawyers and bars access to justice, quality of justice, fundamental freedoms, democracy, and the rule of law. We hope that the next annual rule or law of law report will reflect these developments and will provide a comprehensive analysis, including on independence of the bars and lawyers. One last point before I conclude. The question of digi digitalization, digitalization of justice and the use of um, a uh, artificial intelligence tool is one of the main questions triggering many discussions on the future quality of justice. In order to uphold the rule of law, access to justice and fair trial rights, such endeavors must always be coupled with sufficient safeguards and due process procedures, including the protection of professional secrecy and legal professional privilege of lawyers. It is important to stress that any digital procedures in access to justice should facilitate all parties in the trial. The most important is that digital justice remains human and aims to improve the availability of justice to those who require it. It is of the utmost importance for ensuring the rule of law. The CCP is very happy and proud to have been invited to this important conference and discussion in this panel. And we consider this as a positive step in the right direction, acknowledging the role of lawyers as an indispensable component of the justice systems and also for upholding and strengthening the rule of law. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. You underlined the, the essential role of the lawyers um, as a means uh, and the lawyers work uh, as a means to access justice. Uh, and for that to be uh, safeguarded, uh, the, the importance of, of uh, respecting the independence of their work, uh, especially in these uh, times of, of uh, surveillance uh, of, of lawyers' work, uh, the essential role of the professional secrecy uh, of the lawyers' work uh, is indeed a, a major tool for the protection of the uh, independent uh, court also. Uh, finally, on the list, we have José Manuel Quilhas, uh, Associate Professor of the Faculty of Law of the University of Coimbra. Dear colleague, you have the floor. Thank you. The invitation of the organization, I agree to members of the panel and all the people present here and allow me to a small presentation to support, back up my presentation. I will talk about the courts of auditors in the defense of this rule of law. This is a different area, the area of the financial jurisdiction. And my objective is to show in which way this financial jurisdiction also contributes to defend, to uphold the rule of law. Well, that we have some doubts on uh, financial jurisdiction. These doubts are not new or recent. I brought you a small short excerpt from one of the po most no, renowned Portuguese novelists from 1888, when José Maria Sete the writer, wrote this quote, quarter past two in the morning, Taveri exclaimed, looking at the clock. And here I'm a civil servant and I have duties to the state 
immediately at 10 in the morning. What the hell do you do at the Court of Auditors, asks Karlush. Do you play cards? Do you talk? Do you chat? What you do to beat of everything, just to, to buy the time, even sometimes some accounts. So this shows us that in the 19th century, our novelist, Esat Keroz, with his irony, he showed some lack of perception what was done at that time at the Court of Auditors. But my objective today is to try and explain that the Court of Auditors, at the Court of Auditors, we also contribute to, to uphold um, the rule of law. The first time I entered the Court of Auditors, one of the paintings that is there is a painting that you see here, an oil canvas, an oil canvas by painter Martins Barata, which is at the session court of the court of the Court of Auditors. What does it show? A clerk, a clerk of the Court of Auditors during the plague of 1569. For all the reasons you may understand, this this painting also raised some doubts in me. But today, it's very clear. I can understand it perfectly. Just, I'd like to stress two details, the plague and the, lock, the lockdown. So, what do we see on the left-hand side? You see the people suffering from the plague, people collecting dead bodies, the, the priest, the doctor, and many bodies lying around. But on the right-hand side, what do we see? We see someone who's under the lockdown. And who is there? Who do we see? It's a man of accounts, an auditor today. His locked down in his room, in the tower, taking note of the treasury, taking notes. And with the accounting books, apparently, in a world aside, the plague on one side and his lockdown in his room. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, what would this man do in his tower? And I ask these questions to me often. What would an accountant do in the court of auditors in the 16th century in, during the plague? Would he keep the books? Would he protect the treasury? Would he lock down himself to avoid catching the plague? Was he a, someone obsessed with duty, a man indifferent to other people suffering with his back turned to the world? Was he in the tower on himself? Was he coacted, coerced by King Sebastian? Why didn't he go with the court? Because the Portuguese court had left Lisbon, but the accountant was there. He stayed in Lisbon. And I also ask, what were the caretakers who were taking care of the victims about the lockdown of the accountant? They would say, instead of taking care of the ill, he takes care of the books. In times of plagues, he takes care of the books. Even in time of the plague, he's taking care of the books. So this, this, these questions are asked in the times of COVID, COVID-19. What can the court do in the times of COVID? Does that contribute to uphold the, the rule of law? Allow me to quote a report for this year of 2021, where we say, the activity to be developed by the court would pay special attention to the consequences of the, the COVID-19 crisis, in particular, as regards the new pattern of expenditure generated by the need to respond to the pandemic in the health, social and economic fields. That is to say, the court sought to pay attention to these new patterns of expenditure with a view to solve health issues, social issues, and economic issues. So more so in the context of the European Conference, as regards the plan of economic recovery and resilience, digital transition and the follow-up on the European funds. That is to say, a need to respond 
to to address an issue, a COVID-19 issue. And the court says the court will remain paying attention to the evolution of the impacts of the pandemic at the level of public finance, redirecting its action as manager, as the state, as a manager of these health problems. And what happened as regards the Court of Auditors, of, of European Court of Auditors? If we look into the documents of European Court of Auditors, what do we find? Europe's Court of Auditors, in, in their communique, what do they say? When they presented their report, they say the triggering of the COVID-19 crisis in the early 2020 did not prevent the European Court of Auditors from auditing the performance and the actions of the European Union, keeping its activities during the throughout the year. Keeping their activity makes us remember that auditor in his tower in the 16th century. But let me stress this, the court continued to, sub to present to the citizens and then the political decision makers, independent assessments on critical issues. So both in the Union and in Portugal, people paid attention to the follow-up of the increased expenditure due to the COVID-19 crisis, namely expenditure related to health, support to companies, and the support to the unemployed. So independent assessments, which were underlined today, and stressing what went well and what didn't go so well, and, and stressing what didn't work. Time flies. What can we conclude for 2020? The European Court of Auditors examined many of the challenges faced by the Union as regards EU expenditure, namely in the environment, mobility, social issues, and the economy, to quote a few. So the world almost froze, but the environmental issues, biodiversity issues, contamination of farmland, farmland health, climate change, social problems, poverty, investment, the economy, competition policies, capital markets union, all that was uh, required, it continued to require scrutiny. So where can we find uh, the upholding of the rule of law in this financial jurisdiction of the world of the public finance? Once again, I found a tapestry in the Court of Auditors, which is called the Accountants, the Auditor. It's a tapestry by Almada Grej, a famous uh, Portuguese artist. And the motto of the Portuguese Court of Auditors is quite relevant in, in the present context. That is to say, to help the state and society to make better expenditures. And when we help society and the state to spend better, we are upholding the, the interests of the citizens to stand for transparency, the rule of law, and enabling society to work better. Another important aspect is promote truth, to promote quality, to promote accountability in public finance. And this aspect, aspect is particularly relevant in the, at the times of COVID-19 or the plague, even in difficult moments, like in the 19th century. And now, with COVID-19, we are all concerned in Portugal and in Europe to promote truth, to promote quality, to promote accountability in terms of public finance, both for the European Court of Auditors and to Portugal. Court of Auditors are key aspects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for stressing the, the important role of, of also the, the judge in controlling the, the, the way politicians spend our public money. Um, it's, it's also an important point to be made, uh, to be made uh, at this time. Um, we, are, we are well beyond our schedule. Um, unfortunately, we won't 
uh, have time for questions from the public. I have nothing but to uh, uh, apologize for that, but uh, all the presentations were extremely uh, valuable uh, insights on, on, on the issues uh, here at stake. Um, I have a good news for you, which is that uh, we hope to publish all the interventions uh, soon, very soon, in a, in a e-book, which will be available, of course, uh, in English and, and Portuguese. So thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. The conference will resume at 14.30 after a lunch break. To exit the room, please follow the instructions of the hosts and hostesses and remain in your seat until your row is called. Exit will start from the back rows.
The session will start shortly. Please take your seat. Welcome back to the conference Rule of Law in Europe. We welcome on stage Pedro Benavides, who will conduct a debate on the impact of the rule of law in citizens' lives and the importance of communication in this regard. Então, muito boa tarde a todos. Allow me to start by introducing the uh, panel that will be discussing on how best to communicate. We'll be going over issues and best practices of uh, communicating about the rule of law, which is uh, the core subject matter of this uh, conference. This uh, morning, uh, we listened to references to the role of civil society and courts. And now the time has come uh, to give the floor over to some of the role, uh, some of the um, role players, some of the participants uh, therein, in as much as uh, the concept rule of law may be uh, deemed to be something of an abstract one. I have sitting to my left one of the people dealing with this so-called translation to ordinary parlance of issues pertaining to rule of law, and she's been doing so for years now, Elena Kalistru. I do not know whether this is how to pronounce your name. You are the founder, madam, of one of the uh, foremost uh, Romanian NGOs, a country uh, which by itself also prompts a modicum of discussion on the boundaries of the rule of law and some threats there too, named funky citizens, uh, promoting good governance, rule of law, and the involvement of citizens, which is a sine qua non um, element of uh, the uh, topic we are um, discussing here and now. Professor Alexandre Souvral Martins, a professor of law at this university, he's got a um, doctorate in law and he'll also be addressing us 
on a topic uh, which is amongst his areas of expertise in solvency law, and he'll be sharing best practices with us in that regard as well. Remotely, we have an extra three speakers, Filippo Donati, a professor at the Florence University. He sits on uh, the Italian uh, Senior uh, Judiciary Council, and he now chairs uh, the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary, one of the uh, crucial um, stakeholders in the area we are discussing. Mark Ellis, the Executive Director of the International Bar Association, where law firms um, themselves and their associations uh, come together, highly experienced in international discussions concerning criminal law and international criminal law, and Maya, Michael Maia Rezende, a Portuguese-sounding name, uh, which non pluses the uh, Lusophones amongst us. Um, he comes from Democracy Reporting International, an organization which runs on the conviction that participation is a matter of human rights and governments should be scrutinized by their citizens. Such belief in theory shared by all EU member states Democracy Reporting International actually works on it um, at local level with the media and the relevant institutions in the field whenever possible in cooperation with national uh, organizations. It is therefore with this A panel, if I may, that we will be discussing how to communicate uh, in uh, under rule of law trying to leave tech jargon behind us in helping out the ordinary citizen to actually understand what's this, um, what's rule of law all about. Therefore, without any further ado, I'll ask Elena to take over. Okay, thank you so much. That's because of the name of my organization, right? Fine to citizen. Uh, let me tell you that the first time we've uh, made our contribution to uh, one of the reports of the European Commission on um, um, the cooperation verification mechanism for Romania on rule of law, it was really bizarre to have, uh, you know, all the serious words and then signed by funky citizens. We got over it and I am here to share with you maybe some of the, um, the reasons for optimism I have with regards to what it means to communicate for a wider public uh, complicated and technical issues. Um, usually I am the, um, the person in charge with optimism uh, in, um, in a region, in the Central and Eastern European region, where uh, developments in the past years uh, do not um, foster uh, a, a culture of optimism. Um, without naming and shaming uh, the, the, the negative trends that some of the countries, uh, including my own sometimes, uh, have uh, embraced in recent years, um, I would like to stress uh, just the fact that I think that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic brought us once again arguments uh, for uh, considering um, various efforts to get citizens on board when it comes to understanding why rule of law is important, why rule of law is a fundamental um, uh, value, a fundamental principle for uh, not only for the European culture, but also for each and every member state, um, but also to, to transform them in champions of, um, of certain um, uh, reactions uh, to, um, uh, to, to do 
sometimes autocratic regimes trying to uh, to um, uh, dismantle the independence of the judiciary or to um, maybe um, lessen the, 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 the rights available to citizens. Um, I was mentioning the COVID-19 uh, pandemic just uh, as, a, as a side note, not because it's not important, but I think that the pandemic actually in this regard uh, simply accelerated some pre-existing conditions for uh, for our democracies, um, and uh, to uh, to to add just uh, just a few examples. What we've noticed while while um, uh, acting as translators, as you mentioned, for uh, for for what uh, maybe an anti-corruption uh, policy means, or why it is important to have um, the same kind of legislation for uh, governance, uh, go those that govern and those that are governed. Um, I must I must mention also that we've we've noticed uh, more and more people willing to use the the power of technology to get more involved and um, we have uh, noticed more and more people trying to be of course um, uh, responsive to some of the crises that appeared um, uh, when it comes to uh, to to rule of law uh, sometimes even by protesting but most of the times by uh, by self-organizing uh, and um, my organizations, as well as other organizations, have tried to uh, build on this um, uh, unusual uh, interest of the citizens for for some of these topics. Of course, um, I will I will be also a, a bit more realistic here. We will never have millions of citizens. Uh, uh, wanting to intervene all of a sudden and discuss, I don't know, the the, the importance of the criminal justice reform for their uh, for their countries, or wanting to uh, maybe understand what is the what is the importance of uh, accountability in public finance. I I am a dreamer, but not such a big dreamer. But um, I think that uh, recent years have shown that um, some topics which are related to rule of law, especially some maybe um, particular pieces of legislation that were of impact for, for the general public, or maybe some corruption scandals that were revealed by investigative reporters, or maybe just the impression that some people had during the pandemic that some people are more equal than the others are of course reasons to think that um, there is a wide um, uh, th th there is a, a widely spread uh, threat um, uh, to to uh, to have social unrest uh, due to issues that are strongly related to rule of law as well but i think there are also opportunities for organizations like mine but also for decision makers um, to better communicate to the public and build on that momentum and try to um, educate the public and um, uh, better uh, inform it about why um, rule of law cannot be um, understood outside a wider framework, uh, outside an, a wider ecosystem, in which, of course, we have the courts, of course, we have the, uh, the, the, the decision makers, we have the media, we have the, the, the civil society, and we have them as citizens demanding uh, to, to have uh, equal uh, rights and equal opportunities. Um, the very last point I would like to to add to this uh, to this conversation in the in the beginning of my intervention is related to um, the need to understand that communicating about rule of law at the end of the day is about building trust or rebuilding trust in some in some instances, and um, trust is not simple. Uh, we, we keep on talking about it. It, it all already became a cliche that we need to build back better. We need to rebuild the trust that people have in institutions, in procedures, and so on and so forth. Trust is complicated, and trust uh, means uh, it's not just about uh, nice visualizations or uh, it's not about uh, telling a story about uh, rule of law or some principles. Trust is also about uh, practicing what you preach. And uh, I think that we do have a great opportunity now in the aftermath of the pandemic, I hope, 
to also um, put this uh, this need to to use communication as a as a as a way to build uh, build trust among citizens with regards to the wider context for rule of law, namely uh, as uh, as the as the glue that keeps together so many of the countries that we uh, we live in. And with this, I will I will stop here my intervention for the moment. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Deixou-nos aqui pistas que vão ser uh, seguramente interessantes para o debate. Thank you very much, and um, particularly uh, for the uh, references that I'm sure will be picked up during the Q&A. Professor, if I may, I would ask you to take over. I know that you have a PowerPoint or a series of slides, if you please. If you may see it already, I don't know. Is it available? Ah, okay. So, uh, the, the subject of my short uh, presentation uh, is cross-border insolvencies and good practices related with uh, cross-border insolvencies, especially in, in what concerns cooperation and communication uh, and its importance for citizens' lives, because that's all that this is about. Uh, we want uh, to know how, how uh, can we help to save jobs, how can we help to save businesses, how can we uh, make uh, people's lives better, uh, and how can we have better, uh, better uh, foresight into the future for, uh, for those who, 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 who are uh, being at risk of losing their jobs. So this is the main concern when we talk about good insolvency laws. Good insolvency laws uh, will help to maximize value for creditors, but will also help to uh, uh, put uh, the soup on the table at the end of the, of the, of the day. Uh, um, these, goals, these goals must all be, be taken into consideration uh, when we talk about cross-border uh, insolvencies cooperation between courts, cooperation between insolvency practitioners, cooperation between courts and insolvency practitioners, cross-border cooperation is very, very important, is of utmost importance uh, in order to uh, achieve those, uh, those goals of saving businesses, saving jobs, and so on. Uh, we have uh, a European regulation on cross-border insolvencies from 2015. Uh, uh, in that regulation, uh, uh, good practices, good practices have, have already uh, uh, um, quite uh, uh, significant importance. Uh, Recital 48 of the regulation, for instance, gives special importance to good practices. There are already uh, many guides and many principles concerning those good practices. Uh, the truth is that those good practices, uh, they, 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 have, uh, 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 they have a special importance because they allow to overcome the need of unanimity uh, concerning uh, Article 81, demanded by Article 81 of the TFEU, of the uh, Treaty of the Fun on the Functioning of the European Union. And those good practices are a way of uh, trying to go around the need of unanimity. So this is very interesting also because, because of that. All those issues are uh, related with the Stockholm program in the area of freedom, security and justice, and also with the post-Lisbon Treaty concerns. So those are very important issues at stake now, especially when we are, uh, we are in the middle of a economic crisis uh, that will probably become even deeper. So all those issues are now quite important. We have already uh, several guidelines and principles available. Uh, the EU Judge Co principles and guidelines, the global principles, the uh, COCO guidelines. Well, this, those are some of the very important guidelines already available. Uh, now, we have a project at the law faculty of the University of Coimbra, together with Salamanca University, with the Polytechnic Institute of Leiria, and with the Faculty of Economics, to try to uh, find some data about uh, 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 judges and insolvency practitioners' familiarity with those tools, with those uh, 
good practices uh, guides. Uh, we want to identify the advantages of using those good lines in the administ administration of the proceedings, how they were uh, useful to save jobs, to save businesses. That is the main question here, uh, because this is also a way of protecting the right to employment and the right to free enterprise and uh, to uh, give people chances to, uh, to prosper and to have better lives in the future. Um, it is also interesting to see that these, uh, those uh, concerns of ours, they also are connected with uh, 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 an issue that Elena mentioned. The, we need to have trust between courts and between insolvency practitioners in a cross-border uh, uh, environment, trust across border, across border trust. It is also important here in order to all these to function. Uh, finally, uh, uh, there is also a topic that we, uh, concerns uh, concerns our 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 uh, our research project. Uh, we want to find if uh, there are alternatives to the regulation, to the solutions that are uh, 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 proposed in the regulation. For instance, is it possible, and is it feasible, uh, is it constitutionally admissible to have uh, 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 courts in Portugal and Spain and across Europe with cross-border jurisdiction in uh, contiguous territories. That would probably be quite useful, but we want to see if those, uh, those uh, courts with that kind of jurisdiction, cross-border jurisdiction, are, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, are possible according to uh, each country's uh, constitutions. So those are the main concerns uh, for, uh, for this initial, initial intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now let's uh, talk to our speakers uh, from outside. Uh, this room here in Coimbra. Um, Filippo Donati, uh, I would uh, invite you to speak first uh, and to tell us a little bit about your uh, experience uh, because we, we were talking about uh, cooperation a lot in this intervention and uh, uh, you, are, you, you, you are in charge of one of the, um, the networks that uh, precisely works in terms of um, inter-cooperation between uh, the the councils uh, for the judiciary of uh, many member states. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience and how that um, can help us as citizens to um, live fully the, the rule of law? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and allow me to thank the Portuguese presidency of the European uh, Council and the European Commission organizer of, of this important high a level conference on the rule of law. Uh, as you said, I represent the European Network of Councils for the Judiciary, the ENCJ, which is an institutional network representing the national institutions that have been set up to guarantee the independence of the judiciary and uphold the rule of law in their respective country. Central to the mission of the ENCJ is the reinforcement in the European Union of independent yet accountable judiciaries. To this end, the ENCJ is working on a systematic basis to promote and further develop standards and guidelines for the self-governance of the judiciary and the legal and practical arrangements of essential functions such as the appointment of judges. The NCJ also seeks to enhance the impact of its activities in the judicial systems of the member states with the aim to uh, improve justice systems across Europe for the benefit of citizens. Uh, we um, are convinced that independence and accountability are closely linked. Accountability implies that the judiciary is obliged to operate in a transparent manner. Transparency allows the society to be sure that the judiciary is independent and impartial, but at the same time is not isolated in an ivory tower 
and irresponsive to justify social demands. Accountability is necessary for the judiciary to obtain the trust of the society and at least in the long run to preserve its independence. Uh, Elena Calistro already uh, noticed the importance of building trust. And this is the reason why ENCJ reiterates that councils for the judiciary uh, or similar independent bodies, uh, in order to maintain the rule of law, must do all they can to ensure the maintenance of an open and transparent system of justice. And according to the last public uh, confidence surveys conducted by, in light of the European Union Justice Corps Board, um, low public confidence in the judiciary is still an issue in uh, many member uh, states. Public trust in justice is a cornerstone of legitimacy of judiciary. Low trust in the judiciary provides a basis for bad judicial reforms and challenges to judicial independence and thus to the rule of law. The judiciary needs to be trusted by citizens as well by other state powers, legal professionals and influential actors. Communication is a, an important aspect for promoting trust and confidence in the judiciary. The ENCJ has set up a project team on public confidence and the image of justice. The project is aimed at identifying best practices and setting out guidelines and recommendations for councils for the judiciary. These practices, guidelines and recommendations focus on promoting strategies that contribute to raise trust in the judiciary by improving all kinds of communication by and for the judiciary. To this extent, there is a great diversity of practices uh, uh, across Europe. Websites usually provide easy access to information about the organization and functioning of the judicial systems. Annual open court days during which the general public can access in-depth information about the functioning of the judiciary are valuable, valuable and contribute to a better understanding of the functioning of the courts. Some councils have developed TV formats with broadcast companies that give an insight on, in the daily lives of judges. Uh, judiciaries would also benefit uh, from communicating uh, via social media, thus meeting the public's expectations and preferences. Social networking could be used by the judiciary as a platform to inform citizens about their rights, the role of the courts and judges have in protecting them, and to provide facts to counter widespread uh, disinformation and fake news. Setting up educational programs for school in a, is another good practice. Council for the Judiciary are developing a variety of educational programs targeted at students and children. Uh, these programs can also directly involve children in the functioning of the judicial system, for instance, as court reporters or during mock trials. An investment in the youth is undoubtedly an investment in the future. Uh, in addition to strengthening the communication with citizens, the judiciary should also invest in the relations with the other branches of the state. There should be a proper understanding of the respective roles and responsibilities of each of the branches of the state. Effective judicial protection by independent and impartial courts is essential for upholding the rule of law. The state powers, therefore, have a crucial role in protecting and promoting the independence of the judiciary and on, of the individual judges. Uh, to conclude, at, uh, to achieve the appropriate balance of powers, ENCJ believes that it is important at national level that uh, each judiciary has a structure of governance that can protect its institutional independence 
and in doing so, also the independence of individual judges, councils for the judiciary at national level are the obvious answer. At European Union level, instead, the other branches of state have their own formalized European Union level representation. The national judiciaries do not have such a representative body. The ENCJ adopted the Bratislava Manifesto on 7 June 2019, in which it calls for a European dialogue between the state powers and also calls for a formalized consultation status within the European Union for national judiciaries through the ENCJ and other relevant European Union level judicial networks. The ENCJ believes that judicial networks should play an important role as representatives of the European judiciaries in an open dialogue with the other state powers. I will stop here and maybe continue later uh, answering the question, if any. Thank you. Um, Mark Ellis, I would now um, give you the microphone so that you can um, tell us a little bit about your experience in working uh, within the frames of rule of law and um, how do you see that the, are the main challenges of communicating the rule of law to citizens? Well, thank you very much, and it's a real honor to be here, and I, I also want to express my appreciation to the Portuguese presidency and everyone involved with what I think is an exceedingly important uh, event, and also to come back to a long history of the IBA's work with the EU through the Commission, through the Parliament, through the Council, and so this is yet another really milestone event, I believe. As I think was mentioned at the start, the IBA is the world's largest association uh, of lawyers. It was really founded uh, after World War II, premised on the idea of supporting the rule of law and supporting kind of the principles of the United Nations. And, and, and this is, has been kind of the core of our essence. Uh, and, you know, I remember back in college reading the philosopher Karl Popper's uh, open society and, and, and the enemies. And back then he was saying he was defending liberal democracy, but he really worried about totalitarian ideology in, in the post-World War II period. And, and I think what he wrote about are, are now manifest. And I, I'm probably a little more pessimistic than Elena, but I, I, share her, I share her hope that we can reverse this. But I do think that the values and ideals associated with a liberal democracy, values that I think have been really the foundation of international order since World War II uh, are under attack. And I think we're witnessing this breakdown, much of the post-war consensus of, of really the importance of the rule of law, that being the found of the foundation. So I think one of the most, for the IBA, I think one of the most compelling aspects of the rule of law principle, and this gets back to communicating it, is that it, it does have universal support. And I think it has global endorsement. And it does so by a very diverse group of, of entities. The human rights community believes it. Lawyers believe it. Even autocratic governments tend to, uh, to show evidence that they embrace the principle. So if you look at it, I don't think any one political idea has ever been so widely accepted and endorsed, but at the same time, so contested. And, and I think, and this gets to the communication, one of the reasons I think we have an issue is the perceived elasticity of the meaning of the rule of law. And it really presents all of us, uh, and certainly the international community, a challenge because when the definition is seen as being able to be malleable, then the implementation of the rule of law, I think, can, can flounder. And, and we've seen over the years attacks on the rule of law. It's being, I think, facilitated by a, a widespread public complacency and even ignorance as to what the rule of law actually means and, and how the rule of law is important in the daily lives of citizens. And so with that being a challenge for us, the IBA kind of stepped back and said, well, 
we want to we really want to focus our activities in this area. We want to bring the defense of the rule of law to the front center of, of our activities. And to address this concern, we created two years ago as a series of videos. They're very short videos. They're designed to communicate the rule of law and its component parts uh, and really explain in a very basic level to the general public why the rule of law matters. And we felt that a more innovative public campaign, campaigns that are also being uh, uh, set forth by a number of organizations, and I applaud those uh, efforts, and we just simply wanted to be part of that. So we, we aimed this campaign as kind of enhancing a more critical thinking and understanding of you know, why the rule of law should be protected, uh, how, how it works for, for citizens. Because we know, and Filippo kind of alluded to this a little bit, because about education, and we all, we all know that education is important here. The connection between education, educational attainment, uh, civil aware, or civic awareness, uh, and the connection between that and heightened awareness and the support for populist parties and movements, there's a correlation. The higher level of civic awareness has a strong correlation to a more liberal multicultural worldview. And so when we sat down and we said, let's create eight short videos that can be part of our overall campaign, we'll focus on the components, freedom of, a freedom of the express, uh, of the press, freedom of speech, dealing with corruption, dealing with the independence of the judiciary and of lawyers, and generally talking about the rule of law uh, itself. And so I just wanted, these are, these are each, video that I want to show is just less than 60 seconds, but I'd like to show those to you to get a sense of what we're talking about. Okay, let's do it. Things like judges that are independent, freedom of the press, and officials who can't be corrupted are just some of the essential elements of what's known as the rule of law. They are the building blocks that support our freedoms. But take one of these elements away, and the rule of law is in danger of collapsing, and our freedoms along with it. So, beware of any attempts to erode the rule of law, because if you look after the rule of law, it will look after you. A clear sign that the rule of law is being eroded is when judges cease to be independent, when governments start pulling the strings. The result of Brown versus the state. I find for the state. In the case of Smith versus the state. I find for the state. In the case of Jones versus the state. I find for Jones. Um, don't you mean you find for the state? Oh, yes. How silly of me. I find for the state. So, beware of any attempts to erode the rule of law, because if you look after the rule of law, it will look after you. So coupled with those two and six others that we did, we decided to kind of create a, a, a kind of a widespread public campaign. But we made a decision and, and, and we said, well, let's test this in a country. And of course, this morning we talked about both Poland and Hungary as being problematic in relations to uh, uh, defense of the rule of law. So we chose Poland uh, and we chose Poland primarily because not only of the issues that I've, I've mentioned, but also because the IBA has a very strong position there with the lawyers. But the, the Polish campaign, it was not just directed at lawyers or the judiciary or the legal profession, it was to the public. And the premise of it entitled, the whole campaign was, as it says in those videos, look after the rule of law and it will look after you. So the main thrust of the campaign was to kind of deepen the message about these eight areas and to try to add materials, text to really humanize uh, the rule of law debate and showing what can happen, for instance, if the courts are not independent, if citizens are not equal before the law. And again, we targeted in five areas, uh, target groups of young people, entrepreneurs, citizens, uh, parents and the elderly, and we customized the language 
of these stories to each of these groups. And then we went about making a huge campaign, distributing this and collaborating with key groups in Poland, including lifestyle titles. You could go on Vogue and Glamour magazines and, and see what this campaign was about. Tabloid press picked it up, major media. We, we, we got them involved, including the, the daily newspapers, business, economic uh, publications, and brought in over 50 NGOs, uh, non-government organizations, to be kind of the ambassadors of the campaign, too. And of course, there were legal entities like the Association of Pol Polish Judges that went into schools to con conduct uh, these types of meeting. Philippe, Philippe had mentioned that, too, and I think that's really, really important. We touched the, 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 uh, on the radios, touched on getting opinion leaders engaged, including organizations like Amnesty International, Helsinki, uh, foundation. And so all of that together created a fairly substantial campaign over the period of time that reached over 18 million uh, people. Uh, and our sense is that we need to now duplicate this, replicate this in other uh, countries, and there's a, a significant interest in doing that. And I, I, I don't want to suggest here to any of you that our campaign alone is the panacea for kind of fully, you know, to, to counter this crisis that we are witnessing on the rule of law. But I do think these important communication efforts, along with the many others that we've heard about today, are really an ultimate and important step uh, to win this battle uh, in the end. And that is our commitment. So Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mark, and now I, I, I will uh, invite uh, uh, Michael to, to join us in this conversation uh, to tell us a little bit about what uh, um, Democracy Reporting International does and how it does it, and what kind of tools do you use to uh, reach the citizens and to uh, uh, underline the importance of the rule of law. Muito obrigado. Agradeço-lhe muito por este convite. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, especially for the invitation from the Commission and from the Presidency. Yes, indeed, the name Resende is Portuguese. It is my wife's name. Having short off with my limited Portuguese, I will also share my thoughts in English. Thank you very much for the invitation to this. Um, a very important meeting of the presidency. Rule of law has become an ever more important uh, theme, I think, for the European Union. And we all agree that it needs public support. It's not just a technical matter. In democracies, we need public support for the institutions of democracy more than in other political systems. And I will take, share a few takeaways from the work we are doing uh, over the last year which we do on a project called Reconstitution with many partners supported by the Mercator Foundation. And we are trying to um, vitalize and to improve and to strengthen journalistic um, reporting on the questions of the rule of law. So journalists as multipliers are, are the people we are most interested in in this project. I'm happy to say that in our reporting, we have actually worked with the University of Coimbra. Uh, two faculty members uh, wrote a report a while ago on the situation in Portugal. And I just reread it for interest this morning and they concluded in the summary that although the, the Portugal does quite well on indices of, of uh, judicial independence, the population is more skeptical than those indices uh, indicate, and they identified as a reason some of these high level um, issues of, of uh, alleged corruption. And recently we had the, the uh, uh, case dropped against the former Prime Minister Socrates, and I know in Portugal that led to a massive public uh, debate about whether that was a good decision or not, and a lot of discussion about the rule of law. And I would say this is my first takeaway. We cannot say that people are not interested in the rule of law as such. People get interested in certain moments. And I mentioned this one moment recently in Portugal, and of course we have others. We can say that in Portugal, people have been very, in, in uh, Poland, people have been very interested in the rule of law. There have been many demonstrations 
uh, in support of the Supreme Court, for example. And I think also during this COVID crisis in many countries, we had very intensive debates about limitations um, that were imposed on all of us in this pandemic, whether they were justified. There were many court cases across the EU against such measure measures. And uh, so I think the, the rule of law is actually of interest to many people, but not all the time and not maybe in a definitional way, but rather when it comes up. And in communication, I think we should look at these so-called teachable moments where the subject is being discussed anyway, and then you have a chance to talk much more about it. And my second takeaway is that it's, uh, if you look at this context, it's uh, the controversy that often fires public interest. That's just the reality of media and of public debate. And we could see a, a moment of high importance for the rule of law in Europe last year, when the uh, um, European Council discussed the rule of law conditionality, and it was linked to the next generation EU, so the whole recovery after this pandemic, massive uh, flows of funding to member states, and suddenly it was discussed everywhere. And if you look on Google Trends, you can see that in many, many EU member states around that period, there was a very big increase of searches for the term rule of law. And uh, I think it speaks to this point that working on that and uh, bringing it to the discussion and doing some kind of public information really depends on these kind of contexts. Um, and the third takeaway, I think, and I will go a bit deeper on that, is people who have the megaphone in these situations, you know, that can be representatives of the EU, this can be national politicians, but these can also be influential journalists, these can be academics, the people who, in a way, have a strong voice in these discussions, they have a strong obligation to speak very clearly about it. And uh, there are a few concerns I have about the way we discuss rule of law often in these public debates. And the first concern is, that we are often in risk to take apart the trio of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. They, we all know they belong together. You cannot take one away and the others can stand. And uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind. And when we talk about the rule of law, we often say the majority cannot decide everything at the expense of the minority. And that statement is absolutely correct, of course. But sometimes we should also say from a democracy perspective, majorities can make decisions. That's what they are elected for. And I say this with uh, political context in mind. I think we may have situations in the future. Um, imagine another government is elected in Hungary. It will suddenly find itself surrounded by lots of legal rules, many of them unchangeable in constitutional law in cardinal laws. And they may have a strong mandate to change things, and they will just be faced with legal obstacles wherever they turn to. And they will say, well, we have a public mandate here uh, to, to change the course of the country. And that's what these elections meant. And suddenly the whole discussion will turn around and the former ruling party will talk a lot about the rule of law and the new government talks a lot about democracy. And basically with a long-term view towards these challenges, I think we have to have a clear understanding that the three are all connected. And another issue that I see very strongly in journalist reporting is a very strong influence of political science language. And I'm critical of that language and I explain you why. A very dominant theme in the political science is the idea of the illiberal democracy. And this is repeated up and down in many media articles. And I think it's not particularly helpful for uh, protecting the rule of law if we use that kind of framing, because if you talk about an illiberal democracy, you imply that there are different forms of democracy, illiberal types and liberal types. But as a lawyer, I don't see that in international law. I don't see different models of democracy. I see some minimum essential conditions, as the previous speaker spoke about, essential elements of the rule of law and of democracy and human rights. And they cannot be bended to become an A model and a B model. There is nothing like that. And also the term liberal is quite political. You know, at the political level, many people do not want to be liberals. They are against neoliberalism. They may be against social liberalism. So I don't think we help ourselves to say this has to do with political liberalism. I think we should always insist that this has to do 
with questions of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And I could go, go on about this uh, uh, on the issue of populism, which in my view is very questionable also because it diffuses very much the important distinction between the rules of democracy and uh, issues that can be left to the decision of majority. But I know I have limited speaking time and want to uh, keep some time for the dis discussion, of course, if anybody is interested in me coming back. I've published a lot on that as well. I think it has not helped at all our cause in defending the rule of law that uh, these notions have become so dominant. And so in conclusion, I would say speaking uh, a lot to an audience of lawyers here, I think the legal point of view on these things should be stronger, should be more articulated, simplified, of course. We cannot speak legalese. We have to explain things in simple terms. But I think the legal perspective on these questions is more relevant because we have a strong sense for the rules of the game and that's what it's all about. We are not playing a political game. We don't want to use the term to help liberals or to help conservatives. They all have a space in the democracy. That's plural pluralism. But all have to respect these rules of the game and they are codified in law and they are represented by the rule of law. And that's, uh, I think, where we could do more. And uh, I would also like to second Mr. Donati, who said, of course, the legal world has to improve its way of communication, not only to speak more simply, but also use more modern tools. And I can say that in some countries, not in the EU, uh, beyond the EU, we work with courts actually on their social media communication because they do uh, things and in social media they're immediately misinterpreted or uh, described in the wrong way, but often it's their own fault because they just publish a judgment that it's very hard to understand if they don't explain it themselves. And that would be my kickoff for our discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, that would be a very interesting discussion. Actually, we have that in Portugal. I'm a journalist, so uh, many of the things you said uh, in your intervention were, were really um, questions that we as journalists discuss as well, uh, mainly the use of certain words to describe certain political scenarios in, in, in a lot of countries. And even here, um, the term populism is now becoming um, more uh, of more common use, not always in the maybe not always in the correct uh, uh, meaning it should be used. But I think these interventions um, helped us uh, to think a little bit more about um, the communication in the, of the rule of law. And I would actually uh, taking the cue from what Michael said and uh, also watching those uh, uh, videos that uh, uh, Mark showed us. I would like to first ask you all uh, if you think that we should actually communicate the rule of law as a definition, as a concept, or should we instead communicate the rule of law as uh, not the rule of law, but its components, its uh, uh, essential parts, the ones that are um, linked to the lives of, of citizens. Uh, I mean, um, should we communicate the abstract or should we communicate, you know, the, the fight of the judge that is being pressured by the political uh, power uh, on a certain country or um, the citizens that are uh, being uh, um, forbidden to speak or to to gather to to uh, you know show something or the journalists the investigative investigative journalists that uh, Hugh and I work uh, with um, that are uh, being uh, threatened or even killed and this is something that we've seen in Europe I mean it's not one case or two cases it has happened in, a, in, in a, uh, an area where we are having a conferences about rule of law and it's one of the cornerstones of this European project so um, my question is I, I mean it's probably a little bit provocative but should we communicate the rule of law as a concept and one of the things that you all spoke about mostly was uh, the need of trust. So uh, how can we communicate something, a uh, definition uh, of uh, an abstract that needs trust to work, the public trust, that needs the citizens' trust, when we see 
uh, you know, you gave the example of the Portuguese Prime Minister, former Pro Portuguese Prime Minister, which was one of the, the cases where we were speaking widely about uh, the rule of law here in Portugal. And it was um, maybe because people didn't understand the, the, the decision, the, 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 the court decision, they were talking about uh, being a politician and having a lot of money means that you can get away with things that the common citizen would never get away. Um, how can we trust uh, the rule of law in Europe when you see certain governments in certain countries changing laws with very fast in a way that really take away some of the bricks that were on the video that we saw before? How can we trust rule of law when we see journalists being killed for doing their jobs, for, for uh, you know, uh, taking, taking the blanket out of some corruption scandals of how can we do that? So these are the, the two questions that I would like to all of you to discuss right now. Helena, you can start. Because it's so easy. Huh? <laughs> uh, um, I would say that um, it is, of course, always more complicated than it sounds. And I think that when it comes to communicating, of course, you first need to have something to communicate. Uh, I know it might sound very superficial, but at the end of the day, communication will not solve the, the core issues you have. And then, again, when it comes to communication, you have to have a long-term communication form of communication, which is educating, like, uh, like we've heard, like, you know, for example, we did a version of the Romanian constitution for, for kids. And we work with kids to explain, uh, to, to actually translate the entire constitution. Mm -hmm. Or you can have mock trials with judges because there is a fascination for, for judges and for their work. But then you also need to have crisis communication uh, in which you actually need to deal with all the issues that you, you were mentioning. And I'm going to tell you a very, very short story. It was 2017. We had huge street protests in Romania because of an emergency decree that was passed by the government back then. It was related to rule of law, anti-corruption, and so on. People went out on the streets, the biggest um, protest since the, the revolution in 1989. After that, after the people uh, somehow um, became, uh, I mean, they, they, we managed to stop that emergency ordinance, whatever. The government back then moved the conversation in the parliament and they, they, they started uh, they, or they tried to change the criminal code and the criminal procedure code with more technical issues. And of course, we as civil society organizations, we were trying to say that it is equally uh, dangerous as what they tried to do previously, but it was so complicated. And one vlogger actually called us and he said something like, listen, I want to help you. I want to bring some influencers uh, together. They have like 2 million followers or something like this mm -hmm. on social media. But you will need to explain to them what is, what is the, old, the, the, the fuss with all these changes to, to the criminal code. It's like, okay, <laughs> okay, we will try. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in our office and we had seven uh, bloggers, bloggers I've never heard about them because I'm not following them so mm -hmm. much. But I printed the, the articles, I had a table with the changes and so on and so forth. And I talked and talked and then gave them examples. I, I previously talked with some lawyers, with some judges uh, to, to, to try to understand what are the, all the implications of, uh, of all the changes. And you know, I, 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 re, I did uh, some, some reading with them and I was like, look, this, uh, this coma will change the, the procedure. And this means that and that and that. And they were fascinated. For two hours, we stayed in that uh, in our office, and they listened and listened and listened. And at the end, I was exhausted, and I asked them, "Do you understand it?" <laughs> and uh, one of the one of the girls uh, told me something like, "No. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't exactly know what is the difference between a judge and a magistrate. But the fact that you took the time." to explain all these things. The fact that we went together through all the changes didn't make me understand everything, but it was about a transfer of trust. And I can, I can now transfer the same trust to my audience and to the people that are listening to me because I am now aware that I, I have someone to, to, um, to, to talk to and to somehow hold accountable. And, 
I don't. I, I still don't know if it's uh, frustrating or a big success for <laughs> for me. But at the end, they 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 um, communicated about it. We had more endorsements than we we ever thought. A larger coalition of uh, of people talking about these issues about the criminal procedure code again, <laughs> and we managed to stop all the changes. Of course, the European Commission might have helped a bit in the process. But <laughs> um, what I want to say with this is that it's never that simple and you need to adapt to the situation and you need to be prepared to to be frustrated because it is a fight for the soul and for the minds of the people and of course the populists are uh, a competitor for you but you cannot oversimplify and you need to trust the trust the process and trust the fact that citizens are usually smarter than we think but we we just need to to have the patience and the, the willingness to to explain these things to them thank you professor well i think that the independence of the judiciary uh, is tightly connected with the independence of the media uh, uh, free press and independent uh, uh, judiciary power, uh, those are uh, uh, fundamentals of our uh, democracies. But if you uh, transform the judge into the news, then you have a problem. Uh, every time the judge becomes the news, uh, the independence of the judiciary uh, will also be at stake. So I think that independent uh, judges and independent journalists they, they have to work together in the sense they both have to be responsible every time that we see on the news on the media uh, discussing what judge a did and what judge b said and if he, the, the, he used the right word or the wrong word and so on uh, I would say that this is not the main problem. Of course, uh, everything is also connected, I think, with the problem of choosing judges. How uh, do we choose who becomes a judge? Those things are also connected, I think. But at the same time, you, should, you need to have uh, independent journalists, independent media who, 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 who know how to, uh, uh, to, uh, to find the, the, uh, the essential problems that have to be discussed. Uh, uh, the rule of law is not uh, if uh, Judge A said uh, this word or used that word, that is not the way how we should defend the rule of law. We have to discuss why the decision was that decision. Uh, uh, why do we have laws that may have different interpretations? Uh, what was the reason uh, that made the laws being written that way? Uh, why don't the legislator uh, use better words when he, 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 he adopted that, that, that law, he, cho he has uh, chosen that law? Uh, so I think that those are the main problems. Uh, why is the law written like that? Because that was what created some of our problems mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that we are discussing in yes. the news, in the media. Uh, some of them have already, some of those problems have already been mentioned here. People say that uh, a comma changes all the sense of the law. Why is that comma over there? So that, uh, that, that means that maybe uh, journalists should also make researches about, about that. Why is the comma uh, written over there and not in another place of the sentence? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I, and I, we I, have actually have in, in Portugal, we have a recent discussion about that because there was a newspaper that found out that the prime minister did not have a bank account and then there was an interpretation of the law and then there was a comma there that kind of uh, made every people discuss what is the, the understanding, should he or should he not uh, disclose about uh, his bank accounts or not. Uh, I, so that, that is one point. But as you know, uh, and um, I think this is, this is also a matter of discussion, when I was talking about the, a judge, uh, you know, a, sp a specific judge, it's not about having the, uh, like, judges acting on their own, but uh, in the fact that, f 
uh, to tell a story that interests people, sometimes you need to have a person behind it, not a concept. And that's, uh, that was what I was asking um, when I gave the example of the judge, which is, I agree, a bit dangerous. But uh, sometimes people are more interested when they have people behind the stories instead, instead of only the, the, the concepts. You really, um, have to, you really have to, don't you, really have to humanize yeah. uh, these issues because I think all of us academics, lawyers, all of us could be here in the audience and uh, elsewhere. You know, we can spend a lot of time on the definition of the rule of law. And there's, uh, as I said in my remarks, I, I, I think the, the, the elasticity that exists can cause some trouble. But I do think that there are basic principles and one can, can move in that direction. If you hum humanize those, that to me is, is crucial. And as I say, we, we've talked about some of those basic principles, whether it's the press, independent judiciary, however you want to present it. I think people understand it when you present it in, in, the, in the general terms and you humanize it to, un to, to make sure they understand why those principles are important to them. And if you don't protect it, it's going to come back to, to them. Uh, and I did want to say, if I could, just to counter Michael a little bit, because I think we should be uh, the, the part of this. Mm -hmm. I'm OK talking about liberalism, uh, because I think fundamentally it's liberalism in, in the way Aristotle and Plato talked about it. It's the rule of law that I think has always been and will always be based on liberalism. And I, I speak of liberalism in the way John Stuart Mill or John Locke uh, uh, spoke about it. And, and, and it's the classic definition of liberalism that I think also is the classic definition of the rule of law. It's about equality. It's about individual liberty. It's about fairness in law. And most importantly, I think it's a healthy disdain for authoritarian governments. That's what liberalism is about. And an illiberal government, to me, democracy, is simply because you elect somebody through a fair election does not mean you have democracy based on the rule of law, nor based on the principle of liberalism. That's to me is the distinction. Michael, do you want to answer to this? Sure, I, I will not go deep because I know it was provocative. I can uh, see Mark's point. Obviously the history of democracy and liberalism are deeply intertwined and it's a bit hard to take them apart i would just say that from a communication point of view it's not always uh, i think the best word to use for the reason that i said for many people liberal is a political direction it's a liberal party it's neoliberalism it's social liberalism and they don't think checks and balances and the foundational aspects of a democracy so in that sense it's more i think about avoiding uh, misunderstandings about that. And also, of course, on elections, just uh, to mention that point, it rarely happens actually that governments are fairly and squarely elected and then they start attacking the rule of law. Sometimes it does, but if you look at election observation reports by international organizations uh, on Hungary, for example, they did find serious problems with the with the reporting of the state media, which was totally in favor of the ruling party. And there's, that's an election problem. That's not a rule of law problem. It is also a rule of law problem in that it makes it harder for us. You know, if you don't have media anymore that report all sides, then we can talk a lot about good communication, but it doesn't reach people. And that would be a concrete point from my side for the European Commission in the new rule of law report. It should also talk about state media. The last year it only talked about um, private media. And maybe last comment on the discussion before, how should journalists report on cases? You said the comma makes a difference. There's this uh, saying that the sentence, let's eat father, sounds very different, whether it has a comma behind let's eat. <laughs> and uh, I think it's indeed, as lawyers, we know every comma counts. Um, I think it's not bad to have controversies about legal cases. As I said, that brings attention and that's educational. And people should understand like, you know, pandemic science is not uh, beyond doubt. There are many opinions, there are many scientists and lawyers have different opinions. Democracies have to live with that fact and discuss. So I'm in favor of picking up cases and having controversies about them and seeing different opinions. It's a limit of it. You know, the moment you have authoritarian players in the mix, they tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And they say, because this judge is not so great, 
we don't have a proper democracy, but of course we can have judges that are not amazing and we still are a democracy. And um, otherwise to follow on Elena, I think uh, I agree very much with, with everything you said. And um, I, I, I would say it's important to have a story that's, you know, I worked as a journalist as well. So you need to start somewhere to make things tangible, but then it's also good to have labels. So if people have a certain idea what the label rule of law means, that's a good thing. And, you know, most people have an idea what the label democracy means, and that's also a good thing. So it plays a bit between these two sides. The one thing that doesn't work well, in my view, is just abstract explanations of this is a rule of law. We can do it in schools, maybe in law schools, but it's not something that would work for, for journalistic reporting. Thanks. Filippo. Uh, yes, uh, how to communicate rule of law? It's quite a complex question because we have uh, three questions in the reality. What is rule of law? How, who should communicate and how to communicate? So what the message? Uh, what is rule of law? And uh, I, I agree with Mark, uh, it's a quite complex uh, concept. It includes legal certainty, separation of powers, uh, uh, respect for fundamental rights and effective legal protection by independent and impartial uh, courts. It should be communicated in a simple way. Um, again, I, I also agree with Michael and Elena on this point. And I believe that Mark's video, uh, the video um, illustrating uh, many, many bricks composing rule of law and each brick uh, being so important, uh, separation of power, independence of, of judges, is a good way to explain in a clear uh, way and to give a message to people. Then, who should communicate? Of course, all state powers, all actors, but especially if we deal with independence of the judiciary, it is up to judges to communicate uh, in first place. And they have to communicate by operating in a transparent manner uh, uh, and, and, and in order to gain the trust of the society. And also, uh, it is important that the message concerning rule of law be communicated both at national level and at international level, at European Union level at least, because um, of course we all agree on principles. Uh, you, will, you will have no government say that in, in this country judges are not independent, are not impartial, but you know it, it is you know uh, the fact how, how in practice uh, the justice systems or other um, uh, if fundamental rights are really guaranteed in a given uh, society. So it is very important having a multi-layer protection of fundamental rights, of the rule of law, of uh, judges' independence, and therefore we need a communication at national level and a communication also at European Union level. And from this point of view, it is very important what the European Commission has started to do with the rule of law report uh, in order to uh, raise consciousness uh, um, in Europe and also investigate whether in uh, each country rule of law is uh, really respected. Uh, finally, uh, how to communicate um, and of course judges speak with their decisions uh, and, and they um, should not be involved in politics but uh, when their independence is under attack I believe that also judges have a duty to speak up so what happens in, in, in Poland for instance the march of the 1000 roads is very important. So to, 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 to have the courage to speak up also when uh, in the society, the other state powers uh, uh, do attack uh, the rule of, of law. And, and, and the message, uh, the message uh, on rule of law is a message of course for the society, for the citizens. And because you need to have a culture of rule of law to have uh, 
this principle really protected and implemented. But also it must be a dialogue with, with the state powers because it's up to the state powers to uphold and promote the rule of law. So the dialogue uh, between the state, that, that, that's why in my intervention, I uh, try to underline the importance of having uh, also a voice from the judiciary, not only at national level, we have uh, councils for the judiciary and other institutions, but also at European Union level, because uh, only through the dialogue, we can convince other state power uh, that uh, a problem of rule of law exists somewhere and that this problem has to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I think is that uh, this subject was very ambitious to discuss in one hour and 15 minutes. Our time is up. So I would, uh, before we finish, I would just uh, like to ask you all to give some very quick closing remarks. Helena. I think it's uh, a very good sign. The fact that we are here and discussing about uh, communicating rule of law is a very good sign as it was uh, uh, the special section on the, the involvement of civil society in this and of course all the other uh, the sessions but these are closer to my heart. Uh, I think we need this kind of leadership for, from all member states for many years, we thought that it's mainly the um, attribute of, uh, of the larger countries in the EU. And I think that well, what the Portuguese presidency is a very good example. I also think that the European Commission has a good uh, opportunity to, uh, to, to ensure the continuity of such initiatives from, from some member states that want to keep uh, rule of law up on the agenda. Thank you. Well, uh, I was say that the, the rule of law uh, should be uh, uh, communicated since uh, early years at school. So uh, I, I would say that it is quite important to look at uh, what is being taught and to uh, uh, teach the importance of the rule of law uh, uh, and the importance of it for uh, everyone's day-to-day uh, uh, -day life. Uh, and how, how difficult it is to maintain those balances and how important those balances are uh, for our society and for, for our well-being and for uh, our uh, chances to uh, prosper and to have a, a better life because uh, we live in a wonderful continent. Uh, if we compare it with many other places in the world, uh, during those last 50, 60 years, we have achieved uh, a lot of important uh, 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 conquests, and uh, and I think that uh, those 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 very important achievements should prevail and should be communicated. That is what I would like to say. Thank you, Mark. Closing remarks. Thanks. Uh, I would just say this: as we're communicating this concept in a at times complex concept. I, I don't think we can communicate it in, a, in, in, in to, to suggest that it simply means, the, the principle simply means a set of institutions or statutes and procedures. We've got to focus on the principles, those principles that underlie the, the rule of law. And, and the rule of law in the end is about, is about the moral good. Uh, it, it should be swathed in norms of justice and it should have a real concern about the capricious exercise of, of government power. Those are big time principles. And I think we can articulate that to where it humanizes these points for citizens to understand why they have to focus on the rule of law and make sure they protect it. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. I would build on what Mark just said. I think for most people indeed in European language, in many European languages, it's rule of law sounds very institutional uh, but there's another word which is not institutional at all and which in all languages people understand very well which is justice and justice is strongly related to the idea of the rule of law and we know from neuroscience that the idea of justice is extremely strongly wired into the the human brain and i think that that's why at the end of the day there is a lot of uh, receptiveness for these discussions if we frame them in a, in a good way. And it also explains, I think, this wiring why corruption cases they are so emotional for many people because there's a sense of a deep violation of a sense of justice. And so I think there's a lot to, 
to work on in the in in what we humans consider to be just and fair and therefore we have we we have good possibilities to to promote the rule of law as a concept of justice Filippo rule of law is the bedrock of any democracy and without due respect and protection of rule of law that the European Union cannot survive so uh, I'm very grateful and I believe this high uh, with the organizer of, of this um, high level conference because I'm sure it will be awareness of the importance of this concept for our life. Thank you. Nosso tempo então chegou ao fim. Muito obrigado à presidência portuguesa por ter promovido este debate. Of our allotted time. Allow me to thank the Portuguese presidency and all those who took part in this exchange. The conference will continue after a short break. To exit the room, please follow the instructions of the hosts and hostesses and remain in your seat until your row is called. Exit will start from the back rows.
Good afternoon. This is just a quick microphone te test. Thank you. Yes, I am here. Good yeah. morning. Uh, you are talking with whom? With me? With. Uh... Hola, hola. Hello. Uh, I was just uh, trying to check if the microphone for Judge P. Sarah is okay. And thank you, you answered, so it's good. Hola, Nuno. <laughs> Tens o telefone desligado, Nuno. Jeśli nie ruszy, to pewnie nie, nie zadzą.
to discuss the challenges of rule of law under the Lisbon Treaty and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, we now welcome on stage Mariana Martins Pereira to introduce the panel and conduct the debate. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the last panel of today's conference on the rule of law, uh, which will focus on the rule of law under the Lisbon Treaty and, as announced, also under the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Uh, so this topic, uh, which seems uh, quite broad, uh, encompasses essentially two dimensions. One, which I call substantive, and the second one, which I call procedural. So substantively, we have many uh, treaty and charter provisions as interpreted by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, as uh, President Leonard uh, further explained this morning, uh, which uphold the basic values on which the EU is founded. Uh, and then, uh, procedurally, we have the so-called uh, European Union Toolkit, which was also uh, mentioned and addressed uh, throughout today's uh, conference, be, um, namely mentioned by the Commissioner for Justice, uh, which precisely aims at um, addressing the challenges to the rule of law in the member states. We can think about the preliminary ruling procedure, infringement proceedings, the Article 7 mechanism, the European Commission rule of law report, or now the conditionality mechanism. Uh, so all these dynamics uh, and the questions uh, they raise will be addressed by our uh, distinguished speakers that are today with us. So I will start uh, by briefly introducing our uh, first speaker, uh, Nuno Pissarra, who is currently a judge at the Court of Justice at the European Union. His mandate started in 2018. Previously, he was a professor at Nova University in Lisbon, and he has also been a member of the um, Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. Welcome, Nun Pissarre. The floor is yours. Can you hear us? Consegue ouvir-nos? Sim, estão a ouvir? Sim, sim, perfeitamente. Yes, we can. Very well. Good afternoon. I shall begin by thanking the organizers of this conference on the rule of law. Thank you for the invitation. It is an honor for me to be here. I would also like to salute the other panelists, especially Professor Alexandra Silveira, a colleague of mine. I would also like to salute an old student of mine from the Faculty of Law, Mrs. Mariana Pereira, who is moderator of this session. And I would also like to salute, of course, the other panelists, as I have already said. Now, the title of this uh, session is uh, the rule of law and the Treaty of Lisbon. So I will speak about what is new in the Treaty of Lisbon regarding the rule of law. Now, of course, uh, the Treaty of Law, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon, sorry, did not formally introduce this uh, concept into the European institutions. Indeed, the Court of Justice and uh, the Court of Justice uh, ruled on a case uh, concerning this uh, matter 
and the, the uh, matters that uh, could it affect uh, the the rights of uh, individuals uh, and the applicable norms uh, were all enshrined in the constitution the monitoring thereof has to be performed by independent courts and there has to be a full system with resources that have been established for that purpose. The European uh, Union, i.e. the Treaty of Maastricht and then the Trans Treaty of Amsterdam uh, enshrined these concepts as well. The Treaty of Amsterdam introduced the introduced uh, principles of uh, democracy, uh, of fundamental freedoms, and others as uh, fundamental pillars uh, into the EU, European Union. And the Treaty of Amsterdam allowed uh, the system to identify uh, to identify serious uh, violations performed by member states to be sanctioned. So this uh, treaty expressly expressly stated that uh, for a member state to adhere to the European Union, it had to ensure that um, that uh, it respected the rule of law in order to become a member. Here again, the Treaty of Nice also allowed the Council to identify the existence of uh, the risk of serious violations uh, concerning the rule of law and allow the EU to, the EU to uh, issue recommendations. So there is something else that I wish to highlight here. On the 9th of May last year, the Declaration of on Human Rights uh, was celebrating its 61st anniversary. And uh, there is a passage in this declaration that states that resource, the necessary resources must be established in order to, in order to uh, ensure that the, uh, that the authorities uh, in power can ensure these rights are respected. So the, the CCA um, treaty ensured also that the treaties uh, would, uh, would be in place and that a court would uh, also be established to defend these rights. So what was new in the Treaty of Lisbon as far as the rule of law was concerned? Well, there are four main points that I will list here. Unfortunately, I will not be able to go into detail. First of all, the Treaty of Lisbon introduced the following aspects. As you know, Article 2 of the treaty uh, is, uh, affects the structure and it states that, the, that uh, the rule of law is one of the values on which the European Union is based. Secondly, Article 19 of uh, the treaty 
implements Article 2, and in number one, paragraph two, it states that uh, the member states have to have the resources in place to ensure that the rights, fundamental rights of the European Union are protected. In uh, February 2018, the, in Portugal, they, uh, a court of justice in Portugal referred to Article 19, number two, uh, paragraph one, and stated that access to an impartial court should be a base that is fundamental to defend the rule of law and the independence of judicial powers in articulation with the national courts. Now we all know that there are attempts to affect the rule of law. So we all know this. And uh, the, in, in EU law, uh, it is fundamental that, uh, that uh, the uh, independence of the courts be protected so that it can correspond with the values and principles of the Union. And the third uh, matter that the Treaty of Lisbon introduced came under number 269 of the Treaty of Lisbon and said that the court of law was uh, allowed to rule on the respect of processes uh, in accordance with Article 7 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and that, according to this article, member states uh, could uh, be um, could uh, be could uh, be identified as having uh, persistently violated uh, certain of the one of one or several of the values of the European Union, or is at risk of doing so. So, as uh, per Article Seven of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the Court of Justice. Uh, could rule on this matter. Now, let me also point out that on the 1st of uh, June this year, uh, the Court of Justice uh, is uh, will be ruling on a case relating to Article 7 of the TFEU, because the council had identified a, uh, a clear risk of violation of Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. And the fourth uh, aspect I wanted to point out is the following. Article 263, paragraph 4, part 2 of the TFEU states that individuals can, can call upon courts directly if they need to do so because they can address the courts directly. They were exempt they, they, they could uh, address the courts uh, directly, and this means that the rule of law was uh, strengthened 
and I think that this should definitely be welcomed. Now, once again, I cannot go into great depth here, but I would uh, like to point out that in June, there was a case at Venezuela versus uh, the council, and there will be uh, the, the general court will focus on the interpretation and implementation of Article 263, Paragraph 4, Part 2 of this of the TFEU. Now, here, I think that uh, I am going to have to stop. And thank you very much for your attention, because I have already run out of time. For an uh, insightful uh, speech, for bringing us uh, to the foundations of the rule of law uh, in the European Union, and also for bringing some news from Luxembourg, if I may say. Uh, I now uh, give the floor to Anna Gaudenciu. Uh, she is a professor of law and philosophy and also an investigator at uh, Coimbra Law School. Thank you for your presence and the floor is yours. Muito obrigada, muito boa tarde. Começo a... Thank you very much. I will begin in Portuguese despite the fact that I will be continuing in English for the body of my presentation. I would uh, like to say that it is an honor for me to be here. This is a very relevant and highly interesting conference for the European Union and its citizens. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very honored and grateful to participate in this conference when Portugal is at the presidency of the Council of the European Union and celebrating 35 years as a member state of this European Union. Considering the topic I chose for my communication, rule of law foundations and European Union citizenship, uh, I would like to propose a very brief reflection on the cultural and political meaning of Europe and of European Union within it both theoretically and practically, as a civilizational acquis, and the inner meaning of law as a civilizational project, starting from the analysis of the word Europe as a signifier and regarding the requirement of the recognition of an identifiable meaning of a European ethos and the consequent cultural and political understandings of the rule of law in the context of the European Union, from the question of the primacy of supranational law over the national law to the specific autonomy of each member state. This means regarding globally the contemporarily polarization of axiological refer reference horizons, meaning the, the idea of logos and of ethos as, a found as foundations of cultural nuclear representations, and specifically the reflection on the existence of a constitutive ethos of Europe and within this, on the special cultural and political significance of the European Union as an historically constituted intersubjective ethos, not just not only institutionally affirmed, but effectively representing the sharing of different forms of life with a culturally and intersubjectively aggregating intention. In the still continuously growing globalization movement, generating a homo communicans in a telepolis, it is the cultural meaning of European that is at stake, as we can see, for instance, in the reflections on the idea of Europe as proposed by George Steiner, but also by many other authors. Just for instance, and though differently, in the cosmopolitan approaches by Jürgen Habermas and Ulrich Beck and Edgar Grande. Europe, as also Josef Ratzinger said, is above all a cultural and historical concept. Besides, as also Andrew Williams assumes, affirming a European ethos requires the identification of the corresponding cultural meaning on the one end and of the political meaning on the other, both intentionally and institutionally, and concomitantly projecting both in the corresponding juridical meaning and relevance. 
Considering the intentionally material densification of juridicity within such divergences, it is crucial to reflect on the conditions of possibility of axiologically material foundations of the institutionally binding juridical regulations. In view of the functionalization of law derived of the increasing imposition of externally presented goals on the one hand, and on the other hand, in view of the assimilation of the growingly divergent affirmations of identity and difference, or in other words, of the currently noticeable spraying of identities, eventually in communities of communities. The continuous changes in paradigms, which we have seen since the beginning of the 21st century, both in socioeconomic and technological, but also in geo geostrategic senses, and within this, also in political, sociological, philosophical, cultural and political, and still juridical ones, uh, we are now considering the, um, the revealing of a new world, not anymore the one that the 20th century knew. And within it, theoretically and practically, the juridical and political new institutionalizations of the rule of law play a crucial role as the frameworks for immediate solutions to the urgency of praxis in order to give it a basis for valuation and guidance criteria. Consequently, considering the corresponding intersubjectivity approaches that European Union citizenship combines in its democratic construction from the cultural, political, and juridical points of view, and also reflecting on the decisive impact of the effective realization of the rule of law principles in the lives of European Union and of their citizens in the different member states which means, consequently, the improvement of the individual and of the collective representations of the intention and content of European Union citizenship. Considering Article 20 of the Lisbon Treaty, every person holding the nationality of a member state shall be a citizen of the Union. Concerning the meaning of such a citizenship, as the effective reciprocal recognition of each citizen by the community and in the community, concentrating the reflection on the bounding propositions of the treaty on its Article 2, a crucial assumption of the normative principles of European Union citizenship is at stake. Allow me to quote Article 2. The Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. And, of course, referring to Article 6, following the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, and uh, considering also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's time to conclude, though in these just few words. In the European civilizational matrix, from pre-modern, modern until late postmodern times, juridical intersubjectivity expresses the relationships in which rights are correspondingly affirmed towards duties, and therefore a specific comparability and reciprocity dialectically assimilated between autonomy and responsibility. And due to the corresponding accent of the tertiality of law towards juridical subjects and juridical reality. Within such a continuous historical construction and densification, allowing for the propositions of an axiologically normative foundation of a materially autonomous meaning of law. In such an assumption, the understanding of the intention and content of the bounding values affirmed in the Article 2 of the Treaty in their substantive meanings requests for a dialectical continuous constitution within the corresponding meaning of law, redensifying and renewing their substantial and regulative bindingness. Playing such a reflexive and practical role as a cultural project, law as a substantially established and aimed plural framework is a crucial normative order in social construction, both for laying on, which means asserting, at the same time as discussing, axiological foundations, and for structuring the political projects, and so 
the keystone of the development and the reinforcement of the rule of law, and specifically, the essential framework of the European Union. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Anna. Uh, thanks for bringing us the philosophical foundations of the EU and also for uh, connecting the rule of law issue with European Union citizenship, always showing us uh, how the rule of law matters uh, for the life of citizens. I now uh, give the floor to Elbieta Hoina Duch. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Due to my limitations, though, um, Elbieta is a law professor at uh, Warsaw University Law and Administration. Welcome. Thank you. Boa uh, tarde. At first, I would like uh, to congratulate uh, to uh, the organizers at the conference for making it possible uh, in this difficult pandemic times. Uh, in Poland, uh, Portugal, uh, or more precisely, Lisbon, is a synonym of European community law. Uh, I am honored uh, to address uh, this important uh, forum. My speech is uh, a composition of short questions and uh, discussion points, uh, as five minutes is too short. Uh, or five or seven uh, to present and explain the complex problems um, revolving around the important matter. And now let me uh, let me turn to my presentation. Uh, okay, just a minute. Mm. Something wrong. It's too difficult, maybe. Oh no, yes, you it's possible. Uh, we are in uh, Portugal, uh, the country of Treaty of Lisbon, which rescued unity of EU and prevented the crisis development. Uh, the treaty was signed uh, despite several objections uh, by um, our president, uh, President Lech Kaczynski, to whom Poles pay great tribute also for the Lisbon Agreement. The treaty is a stage of, in evolution uh, of integration and that the European Union is a community of law. Poles share this view. Uh, legal principles uh, set out uh, in Article 2, uh, such as legal stability, protection of acquired rights, freedom, the principles of a, a democratic state of law uh, are in EU member states under the constitutions, norms of law, also in Poland. Uh, however, they are filled with different content in different member states. Uh, in Poland, the rule of law is understood as state of law which is in simplest terms of the constitutions comes down to the obligation addressed to public authorities to act on the grounds and within the limits of the law. Other Polish constitutional provisions supplement rule of law from the treaty as stability and legal certainty protection of life, judicial independence, and protection of property. 
Uh, at the same time, for many years, the issue of the uh, rule of law has been analyzed in an extensive uh, literature and in uh, variation jurisdictions. It is discussed also within the European Forum since 2010 or even since 2000 uh, in the context of elections in Austria. Uh, it is now history. Uh, there is no doubt that Poland, like the European Union, um, treats the rule of law as a fundamental value in its axiological system, but the practical uh, enforcement of this value creates huge problems. It is a formula with high normative capacity large, yet there is no legal definition of this concept in the acquis communautaire. That is because the rule of law has not been uh, defined, especially in the area of international relations, uh, nor was it uh, defined precisely enough to constitute an indisputed international standard. This has a fundamental impact on the practical enforcement uh, of the Article 2 and leads to dispute uh, about what types of breaches, for example, in the field of protection of independence of courts, discussed now, and courts and judges, of course, may already be clearly clarified um, as a violation of the rule of law, and which uh, not yet, um, not yet lead uh, to a different understanding of uh, EU's system and pluralistic approach to these values. It is even believed uh, as Polish, uh, mm, our uh, former ombudsman, uh, Professor uh, Ewa Wentowska, it means that there cannot be one unique, universal, or model state of law. That is because the rule of law consists of many components, which are also weight typological. Uh, different questions arise. Mm. Do we have to definitely define the rule of law now in the difficult period of savings uh, EU economics with the application of recovery fund? Should we regulate the process of stabilization and reconstruction of the EU economic and financial system in EU countries? after the pandemic. Uh, can the EU be called a, a constitutional community? Will there always be an ever closer union? Does national constitutional identity matters? Uh, pluribus unum. Is there fear of losing sovereignty and giving away competences? Uh, or more, one has to constantly ask the question, do societies understand the essence of integration? And are they ready to follow this path? Uh, also, there are no today good answer to next questions. Which authority according to what criteria on the basic of which procedural provisions is to assess the respect of the rule of law and decide whether state of is lawful or violates this rule? Uh, despite best effort, efforts of institutions and judiciary of rule of law attracts political interpretation. Uh, is setting out a definition of, of rule of law is 
possible. Uh, there are more questions. Uh, do they prefer to co create a community of values or community based on common values, but respectively national differences? Do uh, they prefer to adopt decision of the community also in the matter of uh, understanding values? Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You uh, raised very important issues uh, about the fact that the principles enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty are actually also part of uh, national constitutions. You also drew attention to the concept of constitutional identity, which is also a concept uh, of the treaty. So this, this brought us uh, further uh, food for thought. So we now uh, move on. Um, our next speaker is uh, Alessandra Silveira, also uh, joining us uh, through a video. Uh, she is a law professor uh, and the director of the European Studies Center of Minho University. Welcome, you have uh, the floor. Thank you, Sra. Moderadora. Very good afternoon. Thank you very much, moderator. Allow me to thank you most warmly for the very kind invitation extended to me to take part in this conference, uh, particularly held at Guimbra, my alma mater, for uh, six years um, between master's and PhD. Allow me to greet my fellow panelists, very particularly my very old friend Nuno Pissarra, now in Luxembourg. I had prepared a different presentation, but after listening to what was said this morning, according to which rule of law does not mean a great deal to a normal citizen uh, who find it difficult to understand the aftermath or the consequences of uh, breaching the rule of law, I decided to address a citizen, an ordinary uh, Tom, Dick or Harry, uh, because if what we uh, spout wisdom about um, hits no uh, ears, well then what's the whole point? Therefore, allow me to perhaps repeat platitudes, but well worth remembering if we're not addressing colleagues as, fo as follows. No such thing as legitimate power without um, the legitimacy of law, because law controls or moderates power, or at least is supposed to do so. Hence, rule of law, which means that the that public power must abide by legal uh, norms and procedures legal judiciary executive uh, procedures which make it possible to um, a citizen uh, to understand and possibly to dispute uh, the legitimacy of decisions um, public decisions in other words the constitutionality the legality the regularity uh, thereof hence uh, the overarching concept of rule of law, which is typical of modern um, constitutional orders. In other words, to submit, to have a power abide uh, by the law. Um, in other words, again, a legal system entrusted with ensuring subjective or guaranteeing rather subjective laws breaking uh, the natural trend by the political powers that be uh, to expand and operate arbitrarily. And said rule of law has one quality, namely, it's a democratic rule of law, uh, which means that the exercise of power must be based on uh, popular participation. But said participation is not limited to elections because it also 
supposes active involvement of the citizens in solving uh, the issues of the polis, of the city. It also implies permanent scrutiny and control of the exercise of power <clears throat> by um, informed uh, citizens, something which calls for hard work. And it further implies the involvement um, in um, decision-making across all levels of a modern democracy, i.e. responsibility over the so-called welfare state or uh, the uh, measures taken to correct inequalities. And therefore, to take a stand in favor of the rule of law is tantamount to understanding that public institutions serve to guarantee uh, the citizens' fundamental rights. In any case, uh, the rule of law tends to go beyond the organizational structure of the state because it defends citizens against all powers, be it the power of the state, be it the power of other uh, political entities, such as the European Union, or the power of private interests. Private interests endowed with powers, well, which, you might well ask, we've seen, we've witnessed the growing strengthening of um, factual powers, uh, be it the power of the internet, the powers of sporting um, circles, etc., etc. A great many of these factual powers, cross-cutting in nature, without any um, interface or connection with the traditional state power, um, under the overarching concept of deterritorialization of um, power, developed by sociology. Uh, through studies uh, by Jürgen Habermas and others. The underlying concept is that power has deterritorialized deterritor itself. In other words, the districts where we are called upon to um, get involved with aren't necessarily the districts where we cast our vote. Several thinkers, Bauman amongst them, has been working on the notion of divorce between a political power and legitimacy. Politics seen as the possibility to carry out, to operate choices, and power as seen as the capability of implementing said choices, a div divorce um, between um, legitimacy and the political power is nothing new. It's um, a um, sign of um, iniquitous modernity, as uh, an author called it. It is possible that um, democracy strengthened uh, local um, supranational uh, powers, but it's still early days uh, for us uh, to quantify exactly how, how and how much. Therefore, uh, this concept of rule of law transcends um, the um, territory. Um, it points towards a state where law prevails, so much so that today uh, we refer to a union of uh, law, as in the European Union, as opposed to a state of law. The European Union against a global backdrop marked by fragmentation, uh, by the predominance of finance, by, digitize, dig, by uh, digitalization, a um, difficult set of circumstances, hence the return to the rule of law, to the worth thereof, which must be interpreted as an attempt to recover um, by the Western legal um, uh, culture to recover its um, most praiseworthy um, heritage. Over recent years, the rule of law has been subject to uh, ever-growing pressure. 
the rule of law is not immune uh, to the recent crisis or successive developments underwent by the European Union, from the sovereign debt crisis to the migration crisis to the constitutional crisis, i.e. Brexit, and now the pandemic crisis. As Professor Canutillo um, explained not that long ago, being in Coimbra, a uh, reference is due uh, to um, legal masters of that um, university, uh, he said that when the different stakeholders no longer guarantee um, expectations, so much so as to um, give rise to a trust gap um, in uh, legal institutions. We have witnessed um, the, that exact development across Europe. We have witnessed the uh, growing uh, corruption in several member states. We have uh, witnessed uh, persecution of the judiciary, particularly in uh, Poland and Hungary, uh, where uh, several uh, procedures um, or where several um, cases have, uh, where from several cases have come uh, to uh, Luxembourg. And therefore, Kenrutidu said in 16 that we must develop our best efforts in defending and enforcing uh, the rule of law across the European Union, particularly because this is a about fundamental values. This is about determining uh, who we are because without it, we're precious little. And um, to say that the European Union operates as a union of uh, law implies that the exercise of public power must abide by law. The principle of a union of law um, As a norm, a norm that may be invoked uh, by citizens, that norm, that principle of uh, the rule of law, which raises boundaries uh, to uh, the um, actions of institutions and member states when applying uh, their law, and which provides um, assurances, guarantees to the rights of private individuals vis-a-vis -vis, um, European institutions in this case. That principle of a union of law was materialized by the Court of Justice in a famous judgment by the Green Party um, in the case of the Green Party in 86, where uh, the uh, court in Luxembourg stated that the then community was a community of law meaning that not even the uh, its own member states nor uh, its institutions were exempt uh, from a um, control um, with a view to determining whether they were meeting the obligations enshrined in their uh, fundamental texts. In other words, today the European Union is acknowledged as a union of law, and uh, the uh, treaties, the founding treaties thereof, are um, its constitution, the constitution of the European Union. After the um, uh, judgment in question, several developments took place all the way until 2018, where the uh, judgment in the case um, Portuguese uh, Judges Union uh, was issued, uh, repeatedly um, quoted today, the uh, Portuguese Judges Association brought a suit before our Supreme Administrative Court, and they ultimately wanted the court in Luxembourg to clarify those criteria that would then guide the Portuguese judges in that um, case, but likewise across the European Union when dealing uh, with a situation such as the one that uh, prompted uh, this case. In such judgment, principles were indeed, measures had been adopted based on the state budget of 2014, which brought about temporary salary 
distortions regarding several uh, jobs and several roles amongst which um, judges and therefore these reductions these cuts uh, were being questioned but ultimately what the judges wanted was uh, to go a great deal beyond uh, what their um, salary check read um, the union in uh, this uh, case clearly stated that what it sought to determine was whether uh, the um, union's legal system um, obliged the national authorities to abide by the independence of the judiciary and further uh, to um, deduce therefrom that uh, their level of remuneration had to be maintained above a minimum level that would enable them to remain independent. The uh, court issued a most interesting judgment in this uh, regard, acknowledging that for as long that in light of the um, rule of law, pillar of the union, uh, the protection of the independence of the judiciary must uh, be ensured by the member states covering fields um, under uh, the um, union and the law of the union, um, including uh, in fields such as the independence of the judiciary. The judges are called upon to apply um, the union law, and therefore uh, the case was really not about determining whether the austerity which explained the salary cuts that had been determined agreed with um, the um, freedom of legislative uh, initiative, because uh, the um, overarching principle of independence of the judiciary made it compulsory upon said national authorities to abide by a minimum level of uh, wages and salaries uh, to ensure the independence, said independence of judi uh, the judiciary. And, and similarly, uh, the determination was made that uh, such um, independence was essential to the uh, legitimacy of the exercise of national and union power. In other words, member states cannot hide behind their own understanding of the rule of law, cannot hide behind their own understanding of fundamental tenets of the rule of law, cannot hide behind uh, their uh, reading of a constitutional identity to subvert uh, the um, union's constitutional um, order. And in that regard, it is therefore paramount that uh, union law be applied uh, similarly um, at the same time and with similar effect across the uh, union territory. Union law cannot be applied diversely in Portugal, Spain, and Germany, because those who miss out should that take place are, of course, the um, citizens of member states where union law is not being properly applied, which is clearly banned by Article 4, Number 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, as well as Article 18 of the same treaty, which bans um, different, different treatments based on nationality. Coming to my conclusion, Allow me, therefore, to admit that this morning I was rather worried at listening to someone advising prudence that uh, courts in Luxembourg be uh, wary uh, in their interpretation. Um, of union law, namely uh, in acknowledging uh, the um, drives behind uh, the pace of implementation of union law and the role to be played therein by European institutions, I must say I have grave doubts on the validness of this argument and whether it does not collide with the stated will of European citizens as expressed 
um, in um, a variety of means, namely the latest Eurobarometer about the strengthening of European institutions. Therefore, when reference is made to a union of law uh, these days, we have to equate to uh, what extent will the institutional arrangement, the sui generis uh, arrangement resulting from the Treaty of Lisbon, guarantee the checks and balances system amongst European institutions and uh, national ones that is of paramount importance. All of this, all that I'm describing becomes even more complex because uh, nationalistic uh, populisms, which have uh, been coming to power, tend to mine uh, the dialectic relationship established between the rule of law and democracy. They tend to mine such um, dialectics um, and they invoke um, the um, fake argument of uh, will of the majority as if um, will the majority in a democracy has no boundaries, whereas it obviously does. The will of the majority is only legitimate if the constitutional order protects the minorities. When minorities are given the real possibility of becoming a majority at a later date, no majority uh, can touch on what is not touchable, in which case it would be able to touch on the very majority rule itself. And this is where uh, the rule of law comes into play. And again, I repeat what I said at the outset, no such thing as rule of law without legitimacy, no such thing as legitimate power without um, legal legitimacy in the absence of the rule of law, in the absence of checks and balances that uh, build that the fabric that binds together uh, power, uh, law and um, society, um, the um, will of the majority becomes the tyranny of the majority over um, the uh, many minorities. Hence, the crucial importance of considering and discussing about the rule of law. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Andras Yakov. Uh, he is a law professor uh, at the University of Salzburg. He specialized in EU constitutional and administrative law. Welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Very much. Thank you for the invitation. I prepared a few PowerPoint slides and I was promised that I can show them. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. If you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, a few words about the, the, the nature of the challenge that the EU is facing nowadays. We have to see that uh, the challenge to was democracy or against democracy and the rule of law is different from the traditional one. These are not sudden uh, coup d'etats that we see within the European Union in, a, in, a, in some member states, but a slow erosion, a gradual deterioration of the quality of the rule of law. You can also talk about the deaths by cows and cuts. Uh, very often the measures that we see in these member states are not obvious, so they don't obviously or blatantly uh, breach the, or violate uh, the, the principle of the rule of law. Sometimes they do, but that's actually rare. What is often happening that, uh, that uh, many small steps, and most of them uh, do not look like on their own as violating the rule of law. Uh, in, in their sum, they do contribute to a, a very strong deterioration of the quality of the rule of law. You also talk about plausible deniability. So they look like, uh, like uh, usual or democratic steps. Very often they are borrowed from other countries where in a different context they, they work well. But uh, in, the, in, in, in a system or, or in their combination, they, they are destined actually, that's, uh, that's, their, that's their purpose uh, to, to, to build a half-authoritarian system. 
sometimes you also read about a frog in a cooking pan. So the individual steps are not frightening, but uh, but uh, taken together, all these steps lead to 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 results which uh, which which show very clearly on on rule of law indexes and on on, on in, in various uh, reports on the state of the rule of law in some some uh, EU member states. Uh, in the literature, you have uh, various expressions for this, like anti-constitutional populist backsliding from Wojciech Sadurski, or decline of liberal constitutionalism, de-democratization, erosion of democracy and constitutionalism, regression of democracy, democratic deconsolidation or constitutional regression. Basically, they all describe very similar phenomena, similar phenomena that uh, we can uh, observe in EU member states, uh, former socialist Eastern European EU member states. If you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, here I have, uh, I have collected a, a few risk factors that I think uh, uh, contribute to, to problems in these countries, not only in these countries, also all over the world we see similar uh, developments, but uh, especially in, uh, in these uh, Eastern European EU member countries. And uh, it's a long list. I'm not going to talk about that because I, 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 I was instructed uh, to talk uh, briefly uh, in, my, in my presentation. So I'm, I will also only, only emphasize three elements, which is number one, number four, and number five in my list. <clears throat> paradoxically, I, I know it's very sad, but paradoxically, the EU membership uh, contributed to the decline of the rule of law and democracy in these countries. I know it sounds shocking, so I will try to explain to you in the next uh, two minutes what I mean by this. Uh, in point number one, I mentioned that uh, that's a usual thesis in, in, in political science that, that uh, the fact that you have uh, uh, free natural resources very often uh, contributes uh, to the stability of authoritarian regimes, uh, like uh, oil shakes or, or countries where you have uh, natural resources, so you, can, uh, you have enough money to make the population uh, happy and to, to swallow the, 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 the violation of, uh, of, of, of their rights. And uh, something similar is actually happening in, in Eastern Europe, basically, large sums of, uh, of, uh, of EU funding went to Eastern European countries, which helped financing uh, the, the build of these uh, authoritarian regimes. And partly this made you know, their local population happy, so they voted uh, uh, the, for those governments uh, which, uh, which actually violated certain fundamental uh, uh, values. And second, also very important, this strengthened the uh, corrupt structures so in many of these countries, uh, you you had you you inherited corrupt structures from uh, from the time before EU membership, and these corrupt structures became stronger by the fact that they received a lot of money. Because what happened that uh, the spending of EU funding was not properly controlled and checked by the European Union. So this is an ineffective way of spending EU money. Actually, it is counterproductive. Uh, that would be the first point. And the second one, which is actually number four on the list, on, on the slide, is that uh, it is also well known that in, in, uh, in countries which have an authoritarian past, uh, you need some kind of uh, external pressure. Normally, there are exceptions, but normally you, you, you need some kind of external pressure to, to keep them on the track of, uh, of democracy until it is stable until uh, it becomes ingrained uh, in, in, in the society, until also the mentality of, uh, of people changes. This is what you call also transformative constitutionalism in the literature about, uh, about uh, Latin America. And what happened is that uh, since these countries became members of the European Union, basically the effectivity of this pressure disappeared. Until they were members of the European Union, they all wanted to behave you know, nicely. Once they were within the club, uh, this pressure or this, uh, this motivation that otherwise you cannot become member of the club, club disappeared. And uh, 
in EU law, this is actually like a, a usual misunderstanding. In EU law, you do have quite a few enforcement uh, methods which could be used against uh, these countries. We published with my colleagues uh, uh, four years ago a, a large volume uh, with Oxford University Press, uh, uh, with Dimitri Kochenov, Professor Dimitri Kochenov, I quoted his the title is The Enforcement of EU Law and Values. And one of our, our main results was to, to establish that, that in EU law you do have uh, enforcement mechanisms which could be used also in these situations. The problem is, however, that in every single one of these enforcement mechanisms, there is always a step where politicians decide. So it is not this uh, traditional bureaucratic type of enforcement mechanism, but uh, the nature of these enforcement mechanisms is that, that politicians decide. And this is obvious in Article 7 procedures, that's, uh, that's a well-known fact uh, with the European Council, but that's, that's probably not even the, the, the most problematic one. The most problematic one is our simple uh, uh, infringement procedures, uh, according to Article 260 PFEU, because what's happening here is the, that the Commission has a, basically a political discretion whether to launch procedures, and very often this political discretion is used in a bargaining way, because these countries are already members, so they can offer their votes in certain uh, situations, so it is difficult, it is difficult to, to, to enforce against them anything. And just a short remark, because in the last couple of years there were many attempts about uh, various uh, rule of law dialogues. And uh, first I thought that, you know, maybe it's just a misunderstanding or it's just a, just a badly designed procedure. And then I had to understand now uh, these procedures are ineffective, but this is their purpose. This is a bit of a cynical game, a theater, that the commission pretends that they do something, whereas they actually do not want to do anything uh, that's uh, that's not really uh, a substitute for for any of the other uh, procedures and the final point that i would like to mention is that uh, eu membership that's number five on my list that eu membership uh, uh, in these countries meant also that uh, that many from the younger and western generation simply left so hundreds of thousands of uh, Polish citizens are in the United Kingdom, hundreds of thousands of Romanian citizens are in Spain or in Italy, and they, are, they cannot influence as much the lo local politics as they could uh, otherwise if they were actually sitting home. This is obviously an advantage of free movement of persons, of free movement of workers, but it has a price. It has a price uh, uh, in, in domestic politics in, in, in these countries. So paradoxically, we were hoping that EU membership will, will actually promote the rule of law and democracy in these countries. And what I would like to say, and what, I, what is my probably shocking thesis, that actually it was in certain points actually counterproductive, unfortunately. And this is also due to certain legal uh, uh, instruments which are left in, in, in political, in, in the hands of politicians. So, uh, is a political discretion like uh, uh, the Commission's uh, discretion whether to launch uh, infringement procedures or not. So thank you very much again, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Uh, you mentioned very accurately that uh, when it comes to mechanisms to tackle these uh, challenges to the rule of law is not much a matter of number because they actually exist, is way more a matter of effectiveness. Um, unfortunately, I think our time is over. Uh, we won't have time for uh, debate or questions. Let me just uh, thank you all very much for your participation and your contribution. And personally, it was also a great honor to be part of this initiative on the rule of law. And uh, tomorrow we will continue this fruitful discussion. Thank you all and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Obrigado. Obrigada. You had fruitful discussions today in each session.
we are now pleased to invite you to enjoy the musical moment India by Hugo Gamboyas and Diogo Passos, inspired by the wise words of eternal master Carlos Paredes, the music I made is a product of the immediate circumstances of the time in which I, li I live. Hugo Gamboyas and Diogo Passos intend to expand the range of possibilities for Portuguese guitar and classical guitar without dogmas or buzzwords, looking to create music that reflects their worldview and time without forgetting its roots and the unique connection to Coimbra. The Portuguese guitar model of Coimbra, which, which reached is its final shape at the beginning of the 20th century, is accompanied by the well-known classical guitar in a symbiotic relationship that continues to this day. In this context of contemporary music, Hugo and Diogo explore new approaches that arise from the fusion of a Coimbraun root universe based on pieces by iconic Portuguese guitar heathers such as Carlos Paredes and Otávio Sérgio and classical guitar masters from Francisco Targa to Roland Dyens presenting at a set of original themes and arrangements where they show their inspirations from traditional music to possible new ways of sound on the Portuguese guitar. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests in stage, Hugo Gamboyas and Diogo Passos, please enjoy the show.
The first day of the conference has now come to an end. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Have a nice evening. To exit the room, please follow the instructions of the hosts and hostesses and remain in your seat until your row is called. Exit will start from the back rows.